Are you searching for that spark of motivation that lasts more than just a moment, but forever? In the vast sea of philosophies and self-help strategies that promise quick fixes, finding a genuine lasting source of inspiration can seem nearly impossible. Yet, what if the key to enduring motivation isn't in the latest trend, but in a philosophy that has stood the test of time? As we delve into the teachings of Stoicism, you'll be introduced to the insights of legendary philosophers like Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and Epictetus. This journey is more than a simple exploration. It's an invitation to transform your perspective, to equip yourself with practical tools for resilience, and to cultivate a mindset geared towards lasting fulfillment and tranquility. In this journey, you'll notice that certain Stoic principles are revisited repeatedly. This is intentional and crucial. The power of repetition is key to transforming these principles from abstract concepts into integral parts of your daily life. Like the layers of a pearl forming over time, the consistent application of Stoic wisdom gradually embeds these teachings deeply within your psyche, making them second nature. This process is essential for true, lasting change. It ensures that these principles become reflexive responses to life's various circumstances. Whether you're navigating difficult times, seeking to enhance your sense of purpose, or simply aiming to live a more content and grounded life, the path laid out by Stoicism offers a robust foundation. Through the power of repetition and the depth of Stoic philosophy, you'll learn to harness your inner strength, remain steadfast amidst chaos, and appreciate the profound beauty of existence. Prepare yourself for an experience that will not only boost your motivation temporarily, but also light an everlasting fire of inspiration inside you. By embracing the stoic approach to life, you're creating the conditions for a significant and enduring change in how you see and interact with the world around you. Think about what would happen if I told you that every failure you face could actually be your golden ticket to a huge change. You did hear that right. Forget everything you think you know about failing. What's coming next will make you question everything you thought you knew. Right now, all that's left for you to do is learn how to turn every no you hear into a major win. That's not all, though. I'm about to show you how to ignore the noise, concentrate on what matters, and bring in more success and happiness than you ever thought possible. All much faster than you thought possible. Not sure? Then get ready for a trip that will change the way you deal with problems from now on. Imagine that every time life gives us a problem or a no, it's really giving us a chance to start over. Yes, it's a wonderful chance to make something incredibly beautiful from scratch. We could, of course, be down during these times and see them as signs that we've failed. What if I told you there was another way? An open road full of chances and growth. Why not see every challenge as a unique opportunity to show our strength, our imagination, and most importantly, our unwavering resolve? It's true that every problem we face is actually a chance to make it our own personal success. Yes, every rejection or no we face is actually a chance to do better, to add the bright colors of resilience and progress to our story. But how does this work in real life? Let's think about it. When we get turned down, we have a blank canvas in front of us. What do we do? We take our brush, which isn't full of paint, but of persistence, imagination and drive. It's important to remember that every stroke we take shows the world, and ourselves, that we can handle any task. This painting starts out empty, but as we add colors, shapes, and textures, each one represents a step we take to grow and get through tough times. Also, I'm not talking about an easy way out. That would be way too simple. It's a process of change where every problem is turned into a lesson, and every mistake is turned into a step towards success. 
we relearn who we are, learn to value our successes, and learn to see problems not as impossible problems to solve, but as necessary steps on our way to growing as people. Getting close. Have you ever felt like everything around you was screaming so loudly that it was hard to hear your own thoughts? How can we find our core, that inner voice that guides and defines us in all of these different views and opinions? It's possible that the answer is both easier and more complicated than we imagine. Sometimes we just need to stop, not as a sign of failure, but as a brave way to keep going. No, cutting ties with someone doesn't mean running away from troubles. Finding oneself again and choosing to silence the things that keep us from our goals is a courageous choice. When we stay away from things that make us feel bad, we're not just looking for safety, we're making a holy place to connect with our true selves. Think of this space as a peaceful garden where each thought is a seed we plant and water. The more we stay away from the noise, the more chances these seeds have to grow and bloom. This inner garden, watered by self-reflection and fed by self-respect, becomes a place where we can truly enjoy being with ourselves, recognizing our successes and fortifying our resilience. Getting away from someone is a strong way to remember ourselves that our worth is not based on their praise or care. How often do we look for acceptance from other people when we know that real approval comes from within? Making this place for self-reflection gives us a chance to hear our inner voice, which is the only one who really knows what we're worth, not seeing too. For a moment, let's imagine that our lives are gardens. Yes, a green area full of different kinds of life, where each plant and flower stands for a different part of our lives. There are flowers in this yard that bloom in beautiful, happy colors that make our days better. But, just like in nature, not all plants bloom when we expect them to. Even with all of our care and work, some of them don't seem to be growing, which is something we really want to see. Please think with me now. Why do some plants fail to grow, even though we give them all of our care and resources? Focusing on disinterest, whether it's from other people or things we can't change, is like watering a plant that doesn't want to grow while we ignore other parts of our yard that are dying for attention and food. Ignoring something is not a sign of giving up. It's a smart choice about where to put our energy. Realizing that when we value the parts of our lives that really shine, we're not only keeping our inner peace safe, but also giving those parts the love, care and tools they need to grow even more. In this case, ignoring means realizing that we can't change anyone or anything around us, but we can pick and choose what to pay attention to. Are we going to waste our energy on things that make us angry and tired, or are we going to put it toward things that give us strength, motivate us, and help us develop? Not only are we protecting our mental health when we choose to value our own accomplishments and the beauty of our own gardens, but we're also creating a space where good things can grow. Like a skilled farmer, we know that some plants might not do what we want them to, but that doesn't make the ones that do well less valuable. Not getting emotional. Now, let me take you on a more introspective journey that will get to the heart of how we deal with our feelings, especially when we are hurt or rejected. Have you ever noticed how our feelings can become like raging storms when we're under a lot of stress? They can make it hard to see or make good decisions. When things like this happen, learning how to stay calm is not only helpful, it's essential. Imagine that you are experienced sailors on the rough sea of human feelings. A person's first thought might be to fight against a storm as it comes. We know that this makes us more tired and open to harm, though. So, what does a smart guy do? He discovers a safe port, a spot of peace and safety from which to watch the storm from afar. This metaphor shows us that it's normal and healthy to let our feelings show when we're rejected or in a bad situation. As it turns out, we are emotional beings. 
but the danger comes when we let those feelings take over and decide what we do. We can decide to center ourselves in a place of thought and inner calm rather than letting the stream carry us away. How is this going to work in real life? To begin, when we acknowledge the mood we are experiencing, we allow ourselves to fully feel it. But it is important to note that it does not describe who we are or what we will do in the future. Giving ourselves a moment to think and take a deep breath before we speak or make a choice is what helps us see things clearly and wisely. Getting rid of in your mind. Now, let's look at an image that might help you feel free. When you walk, do you ever feel like you have a stone in your shoe? That unpleasant feeling that keeps telling us of its unwanted presence as we walk? Well, rejection can be a lot like this. An ongoing annoyance that keeps us from moving forward with the ease and freedom we want. However, what if I told you that we could just stop, move that stone out of the way, and keep going? In the event of rejection, this is the exact attitude we can pick to have. We don't have to let it stop us. Instead, we can use it as a springboard to jump into new possibilities. For a moment, let's imagine that every no we hear is not the end, but a chance to try new things we hadn't thought of before. Some doors may have shut, but how many more are just ready for us to open them? We can see rejection in a whole new way when we look at it this way. No longer is it an overwhelming problem. Instead, it becomes another step in our personal growth. Every rejection or denial pushes us to look for other options, dream bigger, and see more. And who knows, the things we do when we go off the beaten road might be even more meaningful and in line with our true life's purpose. But how do we turn the hurt of being turned down into a drive to improve? As painful as it may feel, the first step is to understand that rejection often has nothing to do with us as people. It could be because of a number of outside things that we can't change. Now that you know this, it's easier to let go of bad things and look forward to the future with hope and interest. Getting past problems. Please share in the comments how you overcame a problem. Let's keep getting better and show them they're wrong. Getting ahead in social circles. Rejection is without a doubt one of the hardest things about being human. But what if I told you that every time you are turned down, there is a seed of a chance inside? A chance to improve ourselves and how we show the world who we are. We can choose to see rejection as an exciting chance to work on ourselves and make a positive difference in the world around us, instead of seeing it as a blow to our sense of self-worth. Getting better at things, learning new things, and working for reasons bigger than ourselves are all things that make us feel better. These steps not only help us get over being turned down, but they also improve our social standing in a real and honest way. When we focus on growing as people and making the world a better place, we start to draw people who value our traits and accomplishments. In turn, this builds a strong support system based on mutual praise and respect. We're not just getting over rejection when we make a promise to be a good force in our community. We can do this by helping, running projects that help others, or just sharing our knowledge and experience. We are improving our social structure by building bridges and making ties that matter, being silent as if they are not there. We are now on the path of life, surrounded by many words and eyes. There are looks that give us energy and push us forward, and looks that make us question every step we take. But what if we chose to ignore the voices in the background right now and just look at the scene in front of us? What if the voices in the background turned into a soft murmur? When we make this choice, it's not because we don't care, it's because we know where our real strength lies. We're not rejecting that other people are there or that they have the right to an opinion when we act like they don't exist. We're just picking where to put our energy and attention. We've decided that our journey, our goals, and our own growth 
are the most important things and deserve all of our attention. Imagine the freedom this method gives us. Not having to worry about what other people think, we can move more freely and with fresh determination, fully committed to the path we've chosen. It's as if the scenery around us gets more colorful, each step stronger and each breath deeper as we focus only on our trail. Taking this stance is a call to stay calm in tough situations, to keep going with unwavering drive and to let our actions and accomplishments speak for us. People's lack of interest or uncertainty can't take away from our presence when we choose not to let it. Instead, our passion and purpose should define our moves. When we do this, something magical happens. We start to attract people into our lives who share our vision, who connect with who we are and who value what we bring to the table. So, instead of building a strong support network on the changing sands of short-lived fame, we do it on the solid ground of real respect and love for each other. Silence can be one of the most powerful forms of communication in a world full of words, views and noises. You're not trying to avoid them or be passive-aggressive by giving them the quiet treatment. Instead, it's a way to stand up for yourself and keep your respect. When we choose silence, we are consciously pulling away from the chaos around us so that we can dive into an ocean of inner peace. Being alone with our thoughts and feelings is when we can hear our truest voice, which is often hidden by the noise of the world. When we are alone with our thoughts and feelings, in silence, we can connect with our core and think about our values, wants and goals without the outside forces that so often pull us off track. Another way to find inner peace and improve our sense of self-worth is to use silence as a place for thought. It can be tempting to fight back, react in kind, or try to show our worth in the eyes of others when we feel ignored or rejected. But when we choose silence, we show that our honor doesn't rest on what other people think of us. It comes from the respect we have for ourselves. This way of thinking doesn't mean ignoring your feelings or skipping important conversations. Instead, it means being smart about when and how to react. This is when silence becomes a tool of strength that helps us stay true to our values and avoid breaking our character. Along with this, turning away from noise and toward silence makes room for deep self-knowledge. We can ask the most important questions about who we are and what means to us when we are calm. As we learn more about ourselves, our self-respect grows, giving us the strength to face the difficulties of life head-on. Not asking for attention, the never-ending search for acceptance from others is a tiring and often pointless trip. You're trying to quench your thirst while water slips through your fingers. It's like trying to fill a vase that doesn't have a bottom. Would you believe me if I told you there's a much better and more satisfying way to live? When we choose to put our energy where it can really make a difference, into recognizing and appreciating who we are, this way opens up. Why not shine from your own inner light instead of wanting other people to shine a light on you? It's an act of freedom to recognize your own accomplishments, enjoy every step forward, no matter how small, and know that the best praise comes from inside. This change in how we see things isn't just a step toward mental freedom, it's a personal movement that frees us from needing approval from other people. Think for a moment about the strength that comes from accepting your own path and seeing the worth in the things you learn, experience, and grow. In this way, we not only let go of the need for acceptance from other people, but we also make room for finding true and permanent happiness. This happiness comes from knowing that our self-esteem and happiness are personal gifts that we work on every day, no matter what the weather is like outside. This is the way to a more genuine and happy life, where our worth isn't based on how much other people like us, but on how rich the inner scenery we choose to grow is. Every thought, action and moment of reflection in this rich land helps a garden grow where happiness and self-esteem thrive. 
fed not by passing praise, but by the pure water of self-love and self-knowledge. Being kind but emotionally detached is a lot like managing the complicated maze of human relationships where every step and movement needs to be just the right amount of connection and space. By being kind but emotionally detached, we choose a path of wisdom and self-preservation. This road lets us spread light and warmth without getting burned. Imagine walking outside in the soft fall sun. The light is enough to warm you up, but the air is still cool enough to keep you comfortable. This metaphor perfectly captures what it means to be kind while emotionally distant. It's the skill of showing kindness and care to others while keeping a thin wall around yourself that keeps your inner peace and emotional balance. By taking this stance, you are telling the world, and more importantly, yourself. My response to others will always be guided by compassion and kindness, but I consciously choose not to be negatively affected by others, attitudes or indifference. It's an admission that we can support and understand others, but we shouldn't let dynamics or energies that aren't good for us hurt our emotional health. It takes self-awareness, strength, and a clear understanding of limits to practice this kind of chosen kindness. It means being aware of how far you can reach out your hand without falling over yourself or the person you're trying to help. This means realizing that your energy is valuable and shouldn't be wasted on things or people that don't help your growth or well-being. Taking this method helps us stay calm and focused even when life is hard or chaotic. By building an emotional wall around ourselves, we keep ourselves safe and can keep being kind to others without forgetting who we are. It's not an act of hiding to choose not to talk about every fight or battle we go through. Instead, it's a deliberate and smart choice about how to get through the sometimes rough waters of life. It's the realization that while fragility is a common human trait, how we deal with it and who we share it with can show our wisdom and resilience. Maintaining an air of strength and stability like a fortress in the face of the world is not a rejection of the storms inside us. It's a statement of faith in our ability to get through them. Feelings shouldn't be pushed down and support and human connection should not be underestimated. Instead, we should know that there are appropriate times and spaces to share our vulnerabilities and doing so with care can strengthen our stance in the face of life's challenges instead of weakening it. This method makes us think about the strength of inner resilience and the ability to maintain calm in the face of hardship. Being cool, in control and committed can be a source of inspiration for both ourselves and those around us. It's a lesson that we can find the strength to keep going even when things are hard. We are also building stronger and more important relationships by being careful about when and with whom we share our problems. Being vulnerable with someone is a sign of trust and closeness. By making this smart choice, we improve our relationships with people who can really help us and understand what we're going through. So, our choice not to talk about all of our problems is really a celebration of our journey of personal growth. This is a statement that even though we may face storms, we have the natural ability to get through them. It's not a defense for our weaknesses, but rather proof of our strength, stability, and most importantly, our ability to keep going even when things get tough. Imagine finding out an old secret that goes against everything you think you know about being successful and having self-worth. A secret so strong that it has led the smartest people through the years. You are about to learn how the often confused Stoic philosophy can quickly change how you see your own worth and purpose in life without needing support from other people. People often think that material things are what make people happy but this isn't just a promise. It's a proven path to love, long satisfaction and peace. Are you ready for an awakening that goes against everything you thought you knew? Stay with us. 
and we'll show you how simple shifts in your point of view can give you instant benefits and a meaningful life that sparks curiosity and questions the norm. 1. Why self-worth is important according to Stoicism. Imagine going on a trip to the center of your being, where your real worth and meaning in life are exposed. Not through accomplishments in other places, but through wealth within oneself. This is the main idea behind Stoicism, a philosophy that has amazing relevance today, even though it comes from ancient Greece. But what does it really mean to be calm as we look for our own worth? How can we use its ideas to live a happy, meaningful life, no matter what the weather is like outside? First, to understand Stoicism, we need to realize that we have the power to change our lives, not fate, luck, or other people's views. It's how we deal with life's ups and downs that makes a difference. Take a moment to think about how often you judge your worth by the car you drive, your job, or the number of likes you get on social media. This is a trick that looks good, but is very false. The Stoic's ancient wisdom points us to a much more stable and long-lasting source of value, our own character and our ability to live by our greatest ideals. Think of yourself as a tower that stays steady even when there are storms. Isn't the light you give off more important than any praise from other people? Let me tell you a story from my own life. At one point in my life, success in the eyes of others seemed to be the only way to measure worth. Achieving material goals, getting promoted, and getting social praise all seemed very important. Even though these things were great, there was still a feeling of emptiness. That's when I learned about Stoicism. I learned how important it is to have peace of mind, be honest, and act with a purpose. Not overnight, but over time. That time taught me to find happiness and contentment, not in what I owned or what other people thought of me, but in who I chose to be every day. So how can we develop this stoic sense of self-worth in real life? Small steps are taken at first. Think about what you do every day. Do they show what you value most? When things go wrong, ask yourself, what does this say about me? The event itself is not the answer. The answer lies in how you responded to it. Now, here's something you should do. The next time you find yourself looking for approval from other people, stop. Ask yourself if this is really important to who I am. There will be problems along this way, but each one gives us a chance to renew our loyalty to our values. By doing so, we not only give ourselves more strength, but also serve as an example for others. Think about how these values could change our neighborhood, our family, and our friends if we lived by them. It's not just about us, we're all changing. Two, giving up more than you deserve. At what point in our lives do we give up on what we really want and settle for less than we deserve? We sometimes settle for less than we deserve in relationships, at work, or even in how we treat ourselves. This could be because we're afraid, unsure, or just don't know what we're worth. Getting lost in the idea that we have limitless potential inside us. This tendency not only keeps us from the fullness that is our destiny, but it also goes against what Stoicism teaches us deeply. So, the Stoics teach us that our real worth isn't based on the changing tides of outside events, but on the stronghold of our character and our ability to stay true to ourselves, no matter what life throws at us. It's so simple, so why do we forget it so often and settle for less than we deserve? When I think about my own life, I remember times when I was insecure and let things happen that didn't show how valuable I really was. Without a guide, it felt like I was sailing a huge ocean. I let the currents take me instead of setting my own path. In the end though, remembering the lessons of the Stoics was what led me back to the road of self-respect and worth. Now the question is how to stop taking less than we deserve. It starts with being aware. We need to keep in mind those times when the decisions we make don't show how much we really value something. Let's ask ourselves, does this job, 
this friendship or this situation really show what I value and who I am. Next, we need to have the guts to say no when something doesn't meet our needs, to leave situations that make us feel less important and to stand up for what we rightfully receive. And now it's your turn. Let's promise to make a choice every day that makes sense in light of our true worth. Even though it's not easy, this road is very freeing. Not only do we show respect for ourselves, but we also set a bar for how other people should treat us. People around us are inspired to do the same thing because it's a strong way to support ourselves in every part of our lives. So I want you to think about the parts of your life where you might be settling for less than you deserve. Don't take it as a complaint. See it as a chance to show how valuable you are. Remember that every step we take toward realizing our own worth is a step toward living a more true and satisfying life. 3. Playing down your accomplishments. It's easy to downplay our own accomplishments in a world where success is often measured by things that can be seen and touched. How many times have you felt like what you did wasn't that important or that anyone could have done it? Not only does this way of thinking make our efforts seem less important, but it also hides what it really means to achieve something important. Stoic lessons give us a new way to look at this subject and tell us how important it is to value every step of our journey. When we look back at our accomplishments through the view of Stoicism, we are asked to see more than just reaching a goal. The values and hard work that helped us get here are emphasized. Not only the end result, but also the journey taken to get there and the character formed along the way. Let me give you a particular view. There were times in my life when I reached goals that didn't seem possible at first. But instead of enjoying those times, I downplayed them because I thought they weren't important enough or because I was comparing them to other people's successes. My view was altered by quiet thought, which helped me realize that every accomplishment is a result of my values and hard work. Something about this changed how I saw myself and how I saw what I had done. So how can we start to value our accomplishments in a way that shows how much we're really worth? It starts with being thankful. Be thankful for every step you take, every problem you solve, and every lesson you learn. Let's not focus on what's missing or what other people have done. Instead, let's think about what makes our own experience special. It's also important that we celebrate our wins it's not always necessary to do big things to celebrate. Sometimes, a simple moment of recognition or a moment to think about the trip made can be very powerful. Now I want you to do something. Take the time to praise yourself the next time you do something, no matter how small it seems. Tell someone you trust about your accomplishment, write about it, or just admire it in silence for a moment. By doing so, we not only respect our hard work, but also give ourselves more strength for future travels. Every accomplishment that is noticed and praised builds on itself to create new hopes and dreams. We motivate ourselves and those around us to follow our dreams with all their might and enjoy every win along the way. 4. Putting the needs of others ahead of our own take care of yourself and help other people are two things that we often have to choose between as we go through life. How many times have you put other people's wants and needs ahead of your own to the point where you forgot to take care of your own? This is a common problem that has a deep meaning that goes to the core of our being. It may seem good to put other people first, but Stoicism and many other life theories tell us of a basic truth. If we don't take care of ourselves, we can't be a positive force in other people's lives. Self-care is more than just a treat for yourself. It's an act of self-respect and a basis for living a full and worthwhile life. Think about a cup of water. It will run out of water if we keep pouring from that cup to quench other people's thirst without ever refilling it. In the same way, we can't expect to have the strength, energy and presence of mind 
to help those around us if we don't take care of our physical, mental and spiritual health. Let me share a personal thought. Before, I cared so much about helping other people and being present for them that I forgot about my own health and well-being. At first, I was happy and thought I was living in an incredibly selfless way. But this disregard started to show its effects over time. My health got worse, I had less energy, and I understood that I was seriously limiting my ability to help other people. It was a rough but important wake-up call. So how can we take care of ourselves and others at the same time? To begin, it's important to understand that taking care of yourself is not selfish. It's necessary. Set healthy limits as a first step. This doesn't mean you should shut people out, but you should be careful not to lose yourself while helping others. Ask yourself often, do I care for myself as much as I care for other people? This easy question can be a strong way to remind us to rearrange our goals. 5. Having trouble accepting compliments. Has anyone ever made you feel awkward when they complimented you? Maybe trying to play it down or avoid it completely? This response happens more often than we think, and it's often caused by having a skewed idea of how valuable we are. There is a disagreement between how we see ourselves and how other people see us at its core. Stoicism, with its rich fabric of wisdom about how people work, gives us a very helpful way to look at this problem and finally solve it. Stoics show us how important it is to keep our emotions in check and have a clear picture of who we are. People are taught to accept praise with respect, not as a way to feel good about themselves, but as a way to recognize the efforts and virtues that show in their actions. So why is it that so many of us find it hard to accept compliments? A lot of the time, we have trouble taking praise because we have negative views about ourselves. It could be a feeling of not being good enough or deserving of praise, or it could be a worry about looking cocky. But downplaying or refusing praise not only takes away from the kindness of the person who gave them, but it also makes you feel bad about yourself. I remember that when someone complimented me, I would be more likely to look for a problem than to just accept it. It was like I was sure that what was said couldn't be true because it didn't fit with how I saw myself. Stoicism helped me see that this response not only hurt my sense of self-worth, but also made it hard for me to see my own values and accomplishments as they really were. So how can we start to deal with praise better? First, realize that praises show what other people think of your deeds and personality. Give yourself the chance to think that if someone said nice things about you, they might be true. Second, learn to be grateful. Say thank you when someone compliments you. This shows that you are humble and helps you have a good mood about yourself and other people. So, the next time someone compliments you, take a deep breath, accept it, and say thank you in a genuine way. Consider it a challenge to improve your self-esteem and your capacity to see your own light through other people's eyes. By going through this hard time, we're not only learning how to take praise, but we're also getting to know ourselves better and with more kindness. A life lived with authenticity and thanks requires us to learn to appreciate and recognize our own traits and efforts. Sixth, not wanting to make choices. We all hesitate when we have to make big choices. Fear and uncertainty often stop us in our tracks at this point. When faced with a big decision, who hasn't been afraid of taking the wrong step? People naturally don't like taking risks but Stoicism can help us find our way through these rough seas by teaching us to base our choices on wisdom and reason and to be calmly accepting of the results. Stoicism advises us to approach choices with a clear mind and to concentrate on the factors within our control. The Stoics tell us that even though we can't know or control what will happen when we do something, we have full control over our thoughts and decisions. So, we shouldn't worry about what could go wrong. Instead, we should think about what we can do now. We are told to put our attention on how good the choices we make are. 
Think about it this way. Every choice we make is a chance to put virtue into practice, to consider our core values and to act in line with them. Fear of making a mistake starts to lose its power when we look at choices in this way. We can accept the results of a choice no matter what they are as part of the normal flow of life if the choice was made after careful thought and purpose. Allow me to give you a personal experience. At one point, I had to make a job choice that seemed dangerous and I could feel the fear of failing. But stoic lessons made me decide to look at my choices based on what I value instead of what I'm afraid of. I made the choice that fit with what I stood for and who I wanted to be. It led to a journey of learning and growth that wouldn't have been possible if I had let fear decide what to do. Then, how can we use this stoic way of thinking in our own lives? First, ask yourself what values are driving this choice and am I letting fear get in the way of acting in line with these values? Next, make a promise to accept the results of your actions, knowing that if you followed your values and acted with honesty, then you didn't make a mistake, you just learned something. When used correctly, excessive self-criticism can be a strong way to grow as a person and think about oneself. Too much self-criticism, on the other hand, turns this useful tool into a weapon that hurts us and stops us from growing and being healthy. This pattern of constantly judging ourselves not only makes us less confident, but it also keeps us from the stoic view of progress, which puts self-compassion and improvement over the never-ending search for perfection. Stoics tell us that we should look at our actions and thoughts through the lens of understanding and reason. They say that we should admit our flaws, but also value our efforts and the lessons we've learned along the way. They tell us to look at every mistake as a chance to learn, grow and increase our resilience rather than as a character flaw. Think about it. How many times have you caught yourself blaming yourself for not meeting standards that were too high to reach? How many times has that critical voice inside your head kept you from recognizing your successes or appreciation of how far you have come? I remember a time in my own life when I was always criticizing myself. I worked hard to be perfect in everything, from my job to my relationships with other people. However, this search for perfection did not bring me peace or happiness. Instead, it made me anxious and unhappy. Self-compassion and acceptance, which are important stoic ideas, were the only ways I could start to break free from these chains. I learned to be happy with growth instead of perfection and to be patient and kind to myself the same way I would be with a friend. So how can we start to practice this stoic self-compassion and stop being so hard on ourselves? First, it's important to be aware of and question thought habits that are negative of yourself. When you hear that critical voice inside your head, stop and ask, is this really true? Is this fair to me? Also, learn to be thankful for yourself. Take a moment to recognize your skills, your accomplishments, and the work you do every day. Now here's something you should do. Every day, write down three things about yourself that you are thankful for. It could be something as easy as going for a walk or setting aside time to read. This practice not only takes your mind off of criticizing yourself and puts it on appreciating yourself, it also makes you feel like you have more worth. When we deal with self-criticism in a stoic way, we not only lighten the load of constant judging, but we also make room for growth, learning and real happiness. We don't have to punish ourselves for not being perfect. Instead, we can be happy that we are always learning in the school of life. It's easy and often unavoidable to compare yourself to others in a world full of social media and cultures that value outward success. We look at the accomplishments of others as if they were a mirror showing us our flaws. But we forget that everyone's journey is different and can't be compared to others. Always comparing ourselves to others makes us unhappy and envious, and it takes us off the real road of growing as a person and accepting ourselves as we are. 
In this situation, Stoic lessons can help us find our way. They tell us to look inside ourselves, notice our progress, and be thankful for the unique path we are on. Stoics tell us that the worth of our lives is not based on what we have or how well we do compared to others, but on how good our character is and what we do to make the world a better place. They tell us to be proud of our own growth without comparing it to what other people have done. Pause and think. How many times have you caught yourself judging your own success by someone else's? And just how many times has that made you happy or satisfied? When you compare everything all the time, you're always running a race with no finish line and happiness is always just another faraway goal. There was a time in my life when comparing myself to others seemed like a second job. No matter how far I got, it seemed like someone was always ahead of me. I could not find true peace and happiness until I adopted the stoic view of being thankful for my own journey and focusing on my own growth. So how can we use this stoic wisdom to stop comparing everything all the time? To begin, it's important to show thanks. Think about what you have, what you've accomplished, and the problems you've solved. Being thankful keeps us in the present and shows us how important our trip is. Also, make a promise to grow as a person. Don't base your goals on what other people have accomplished. Instead, choose goals that are in line with your own values and interests. So, here's what you should do. This week, set a small but important goal for yourself that has nothing to do with comparing yourself to others. We can start to break free from the chains of comparison when we focus on our own journey and celebrate our own progress. There will be hard times on this path, but it is also one of growth and success. Many of us fall into the mistake of not investing in ourselves and always comparing ourselves to others, and most of the time, we don't even know it. Comparing ourselves to others all the time can make us unhappy and dissatisfied, keeping us from enjoying our own unique journey. Stoicism, which focuses on personal growth and independence, gives us a freeing view on how to get past this tendency and be happy with the road we choose for ourselves. Just for a moment, picture being able to look at your life and accomplishments without having to worry about how they compare to others. Stoicism tells us that the only real standard to measure ourselves by is ourselves from the past, not other people. By focused on our own growth and success, we take our attention off of things going on around us that might take us off track. Let's talk about personal effort and progress that goes on over time. Self-respecting ourselves by putting money into our own growth is one of the best things we can do for ourselves. Stoicism tells us to see every day as a chance to learn, grow and get better. This doesn't mean always wanting more, it means committing to always getting better, knowing that real worth comes from within. Have you thought about when you last put money into your own growth? Personal investment is important for human development, whether it's learning a new skill, setting aside time for meditation and thought, or just giving yourself room to be creative. By making a commitment to personal growth, we not only show respect for ourselves, but we also give ourselves the power to help others in more important ways. Taking steps to improve ourselves not only makes our lives better, but it can also inspire those we're on the trip with us. Now it's your turn. Think of a part of your life that you'd like to grow or get better at. Make a promise to yourself to do something small but important today to begin this growth path. It's important to remember that investment in yourself is the key to all other success. As we follow the stoic philosophy of focusing on our own growth and being thankful for our journey, we can start to see the beauty in being ourselves and value how our experience is unique. Giving up the need to compare ourselves to others all the time and focusing on our own growth is not only a kind thing to do, but it can also help us live a fuller, more worthwhile life. You got a sneak peek at how stoicism can change your life. 
but this is only the beginning. As you go deeper into this journey of self-discovery and growth, think of all the amazing things that could happen. If this made you feel something, there's a lot more to discover and change. Do not fall behind. Now we'll talk about 12 signs that it might be time to end a relationship, even if it's with a friend or family member. If someone consistently shows disrespect in a relationship through words or actions, that is a major breach of Stoic values. Stoicism stresses how important it is to treat others with respect and kindness and to see the worth in every person. In a relationship where people are rude to each other, this basic concept is broken, which damages trust and unity. Long-term disrespect in a relationship, even if it's with family or a friend you've known for a long time, can have serious effects on your health. Stoicism tells people to find inner peace and resilience, which are traits that are put to the test when they are treated badly over and over again. This kind of treatment can lower self-esteem, make people angry, and keep them in a loop of negativity that is bad for their mental and emotional health. Additionally, Stoicism stresses how important it is to set limits and treat yourself with care. Constantly putting up with rudeness not only breaks these rules, but it also keeps the relationship in a state of submission and unbalance. When you put up with disrespect, you're actually encouraging it, which is a bad habit that weakens the bonds of respect and understanding between people. When you think about these things, Stoicism gives you a serious view on why you need to end situations where disrespect is constant. There is a lot of complexity and emotional weight in the decision to cut ties, especially with people you care about. Stoic philosophy tells people of their natural worth and the need to put their own well-being first. It's easier to have better, more satisfying relationships, even when you have to make tough decisions if you act in line with Stoic ideals of virtue and self-respect. Not giving and receiving. The Stoic view stresses how important it is to respect yourself and look after your own health. So, staying in a relationship where there is a constant lack of exchange goes against this basic idea. Stoicism stresses the importance of developing inner peace and virtue, and it tells people to make sure their actions are in line with reason and virtue. So, putting up with a one-sided situation where your efforts aren't appreciated or returned hurts, your goal of virtue and causes inner conflict. Additionally, Stoicism stresses how important it is to recognize and accept the facts that are within our control. We can't make other people do or feel what we want them to, but we can control how we react and what we choose to do. So, realizing the imbalance in a relationship where neither person gives or receives anything in return gives people the power to set limits and put their own health first. Stoicism encourages people to face hard facts and take direct action that is in line with their values. It calls for a thoughtful and mindful approach to life's difficulties. Stoics stress the importance of making relationships that are based on virtue and mutual gain, which strikes a chord with me. Relationships that don't involve exchange naturally lack the food that people need to grow and thrive. People who listen to the Stoic call to put inner peace and good behavior first are more likely to be able to tell when a relationship has gone off track and bravely make a new path toward better, more fulfilling connections. Following the Stoic way of life means that realizing and dealing with the lack of return is not only the smart thing to do, but also a deep act of self-respect and self-care. Being manipulative. Any kind of manipulative behavior, no matter how obvious or not, hurts the truthfulness and authenticity that are needed for real relationships. According to Stoicism, people should strive for virtue and act in a way that makes sense. This naturally goes against manipulative behavior that tries to trick or control others. This kind of behavior not only breaks trust, but it also changes the way the relationship works, which can make you angry, disappointed, and emotionally unstable. 
According to Stoic philosophy, the key to a happy life is to seek eudaimonia, which means flourishing. But staying in relationships that are stained by manipulation goes against this goal because it creates a harmful setting that is bad for your health. Stoicism advises people to put their own development and happiness first, which may mean staying away from interactions that involve manipulation or lies. Stoic ideas of self-respect and virtue say that these kinds of relationships should end, even if they involve family or close friends. Stoicism advises people to keep their mind on what they can control, their own acts and well-being, even though ending a relationship can be difficult. Freeing yourself from relationships that are manipulative can make room for better ones based on honesty, mutual respect and real friendship. This will help you live a more happy and good life in line with Stoic principles. Drain on emotions. In Stoicism, stopping ties, even ones with family or friends, is something that is carefully thought out and done in line with rules that promote personal well-being and virtue. One important thing that Stoicism stresses is the need to be aware of how relationships drain your emotions. Constant negative drama or emotional upheaval can have a big effect on a person's mental health and peace of mind. Stoicism stresses how important it is to keep your inner peace and calm, even when life is hard. Relationships that keep upsetting this balance may need to be re-evaluated. The Stoic view on how relationships drain. Emotional energy shows how important it is to keep your mental and emotional strength. A strong family and buddy bond is important, but Stoicism also stresses the importance of keeping ties that help you grow and thrive. Being around negativity, drama or emotional upheaval all the time can drain your energy, leaving you with little time for self-care and growth. From a Stoic point of view, ending a relationship that drains your emotions is based on logic and the desire to protect yourself. Stoics understand that some relationships may no longer be helpful and may even get in the way of our progress toward virtue and happiness. Individuals who put their mental and emotional health first are more likely to embody Stoic ideas of self-mastery and resilience in the face of hardship. Stoicism also pushes people to build up their inner strength and resilience so they can handle tough situations like when relationships end. People can make the choice to end a toxic relationship with clarity and peace of mind by practicing tough habits like awareness, acceptance and focusing on what they can control. Finally, the silent way of ending relationships shows how important emotional drain is for figuring out how healthy and viable a partnership is. People who put their inner peace and self-care first are in line with the stoic principles of virtue and reason when dealing with the difficulties of human relationships, even if it means saying goodbye to loved ones. Values not matching up. Values that don't match up between two people can lead to arguments and make it harder to build a good connection. Stoic beliefs say that seeking virtue is the most important thing and relationships that are very different from this goal can be hard on your morals and inner peace. Having different core values can make things difficult in a relationship, cause confusion and make people feel like they don't fit in morally. Additionally, Stoicism stresses how important it is to surround yourself with people who share your morals and beliefs. This doesn't mean that having different points of view is always bad. Instead, it shows how important it is to agree on basic things when it comes to morality and virtue. When two people enter a relationship with shared beliefs, they are more likely to accept, care about and work together which is good for both of their personal growth and happiness. According to Stoic ideas, realizing that your values are at odds with each other can help you think about yourself and make decisions. Even if the person is family or a long-time friend, ending a relationship can be hard on the emotions. Stoicism says that people should put their morals and health first. 
By realizing how important it is for relationships to be based on shared values, people can make friends in a way that is clear and purposeful, building relationships that support their commitment to virtue and inner peace. Betrayals over and over, personal virtue and keeping your inner peace no matter what is going on around you are important in Stoic philosophy. People are told to look at the situation clearly and logically when they have been betrayed more than once. Even though it might be hard, stopping a relationship where someone keeps betraying you is in line with Stoic ideas about self-respect and mental health. Repeated betrayals break down the trust that is needed to make real relationships. Stoicism tells people to focus on what they can change. They can't change what other people do, but they can change how they react to what they do. Constantly being betrayed can make you feel bad and stop you from growing as a person. Stoicism also stresses how important it is to keep good relationships where honesty and mutual respect are valued. People who stop relationships where they are repeatedly lied to show that they care about their own morals and well-being. With a clear mind and a caring knowledge of your own limits and ideals, it's important to make these kinds of choices. It can be hard to end a relationship, especially with a family member or close friend. Stoicism can help you put your self-respect and inner peace first. In short, Stoicism stresses how important trust is in relationships and urges people to end relationships where betrayals happen over and over again. This fits with the philosophy's focus on personal virtue, reason and mental health leading to a more peaceful and honest life in the long run. Having a stifled or limited feeling. The stoic ideal of living in peace with nature and one's real self goes against feeling confined or limited in a relationship. Stoicism says that everyone is naturally able to think and be aware of themselves. Using these natural abilities is what leads to eudaimonia or happiness. When someone's relationship makes it hard for them to be themselves, it causes a conflict between them and their true nature. Stoicism stresses how important it is to live in line with your values and principles. Any relationship that gets in the way of this could lead to inner turmoil and unhappiness. Stoicism also recognizes that having to deal with such limitations can cause anger and inner strife which are the opposite of what you want to achieve, peace and virtue. People who practice Stoicism are told to know when a relationship is getting in the way of their personal growth and to end the relationship if that's what needs to be done. Stoicism, on the other hand, also teaches the value of patience and wisdom in all one's deeds. It's not easy to end a relationship especially one with family or close friends who have been there for a long time. It takes a lot of thought and analysis of what might happen. Stoicism leads to a life of virtue, which includes building relationships that help you grow and be happy. People can live more in line with the Stoic ideal of living in harmony with nature and finding inner peace by noticing and dealing with relationships that make it hard for them to be themselves. Even if there is abuse or violence, the Stoic view on relationships emphasizes the idea that bearing abuse goes against the ideas of self-respect and honor. Stoics believe that everyone has a responsibility to put their own health and safety first, even if that means cutting ties with people they care about. This idea fits with the Stoic idea of living in balance with nature which means accepting and honoring your own inherent worth and seeking inner peace and harmony. Instead of seeing ending a relationship with abuse or violence as a breach of duty or loyalty, Stoicism sees it as a way to protect oneself and honor one's morals. Stoics believe that developing inner strength and resilience in the face of hardship is important, but they also know how important it is to set healthy limits and stay away from situations that are hurtful. People show their dedication to self-respect and honor by ending relationships that are abusive or violent, 
This is in line with Stoic beliefs of personal ethics and living an honest life. This choice shows a deep knowledge of Stoic lessons about how important it is to develop inner virtue and live a life based on reason and moral virtue. In the end, Stoicism is a deep way to deal with complicated relationship patterns. It reminds people of their natural worth and how important it is to put their own well-being and honor first, even when they have to make hard choices like ending ties with family or friends. Not wanting to talk about or fix problems, in Stoicism, relationships are seen as ways for both people to grow and help each other, based on ideals like honesty, ethics, and resilience. But there is a point at which keeping a friendship going, even with family or close friends, is bad for your health. Based on Stoic ideas, one important sign that a relationship needs to end is when the other person refuses to talk to you in an open and productive way. Good communication is key to healthy relationships because it lets people talk about their problems and work out solutions together. Stoicism stresses how important it is to face problems head-on, recognizing that dodging or ignoring problems only makes them last longer and could get worse. This kind of behavior weakens the connection when one person refuses to talk or settle disagreements over and over again. Stoicism encourages people to grow and thrive, which can only happen in a place where people can understand and help each other. If someone consistently blocks contact or refuses to have a useful conversation, it limits growth and stops the relationship from progressing. In these situations, sticking in the relationship can keep you stuck in a loop of anger, annoyance and frustration, which will eventually stop both of you from moving forward. Since Stoicism recognizes how important speech is for good relationships, it pushes people to think about whether the other person's refusal to talk fits with their values and well-being. If trying to talk about problems or settle disagreements is always met with pushback or lack of interest, it could mean that the relationship is no longer serving its purpose. Even though it can be hard to stop relationships, especially with people we care about, Stoicism tells us that we need to put our own growth and mental health first. By realizing that the relationship has its limits and having the strength to let go, people can open the door to new chances for personal growth and happiness that are in line with the stoic principles of virtue and resilience. Persistent neglect. In Stoicism, a philosophy based on personal virtue and reason, stopping relationships, even with family or friends, is thought of in a complex way that takes into account one's health and inner peace. One important sign that makes you think about this is continuous neglect. This is when one person constantly ignores or doesn't care about the other person. It's a powerful sign that neither person wants to keep the relationship going over time. Stoicism stresses how important it is for people to respect and help each other in relationships. When one person acts neglectfully over and over again, it throws off the delicate balance that is needed for healthy relationships. Neglect can show up in many ways, such as not being emotionally available, not talking to each other, or not putting the relationship first when there are other things that need to be done. No matter what form it takes, the underlying meaning is always the same, a lack of respect for the tie that people share. Being patient means realizing that partnerships take work and dedication from everyone concerned. However, neglect means that these important things are not being cared for or are not being able to be cared for. It creates a situation where one person has to keep the relationship going, which leads to unbalance and eventually dissatisfaction. Sticking to stoic principles means that people should put their own health and happiness first and build relationships that help them grow and thrive. One big problem with this goal is that persistent disregard in a relationship makes it hard to reach. It hurts faith, breaks down emotional connections 
and gets in the way of both people's journey to happiness. Stoicism tells people to know when a relationship isn't good for them anymore, even if it means breaking up with family or friends they've had for a long time. People can accept the stoic virtue of wisdom by recognizing the truth of chronic neglect and what it means. They can then be wise in their relationships and put their own well-being above all else. Growth misalignment. In Stoicism, growth and personal progress are very important. The philosophy stresses that each person should strive for virtue, reason and personal growth. Focusing on what you can control and making sure your actions are in line with your values and goals are at the heart of this effort. When it comes to partnerships, Stoicism says that any link that gets in the way of your goals or growth should be carefully thought through, even if it's with a family member or close friend. Stoicism's principle of growth mismatch shows how important it is to look at relationships in terms of how they affect your growth. If a relationship regularly gets in the way of growth or takes you off track from your goals for self-improvement, it may no longer be useful. Stoic ideas encourage people to develop inner strength and resilience, telling them to put their health and happiness first and do things that will make them happy. It can be hard on the emotions to end a relationship, especially one with someone you care about. Stoicism, on the other hand, gives you a way to make these kinds of choices in a clear and logical way by looking at how well the relationship fits with their beliefs, goals, and general growth path, people can tell if staying in the relationship helps them grow or gets in the way of their progress toward virtue. Stoicism also stresses how important it is to accept things that are out of your control, like the way relationships work. While stopping a relationship might make people feel sad or like they've lost something, Stoic philosophy tells people to focus on what they can change, their own thoughts, actions, and attitudes. People can handle the difficulties of relationships with calm and honesty if they do these things. They can put their own health and happiness first while building relationships that support their values and goals. Stoicism basically gives people a way to look at their relationships and figure out when one isn't helping their growth and well-being anymore. Individuals can handle the difficulties of partnerships with wisdom and resilience by adhering to the ideas of personal growth and smart decision-making, while also acknowledging their own path to virtue and happiness. Set limits. If you want to follow the stoic way of life, you have to set limits in your relationships, even with family and friends. This is very important for your health and growth. Stoicism, a philosophy that promotes virtue, reason and self-control, stresses the value of inner peace in the face of adversity. But this peace of mind shouldn't mean staying in situations that are damaging or poisonous. An important way to protect your emotional and mental health is to set limits. People show their independence and self-respect by making clear what is and isn't okay in a relationship. According to Stoicism, we should only think about the things we can control. Setting limits is a clear example of this. It can be hard to stop ties, especially with people we care about, but it may be important for our own growth and happiness. Stoicism encourages people to live by their own values and principles, if a relationship regularly goes against those values or stops you from growing as a person, it might be time to rethink whether to stay in it. Setting limits is also consistent with stoic ideas about resilience and flexibility. It helps people handle their relationships calmly and clearly, even when things go wrong or they argue. When you set clear limits, you create better relationships and make it less likely that failed expectations will lead to anger or conflict. Stoicism is a way of thinking about relationships that promotes wisdom and judgment. It says that relationships are important, but it also says that self-respect and mental health are even more important. 
Stoic principles tell us that setting limits in relationships gives people the power to create satisfying and peaceful interactions that make their lives better. Always keep in mind that stopping relationships can be hard, but Stoicism tells us to put our health first and concentrate on what we can control. You can choose to get back up after life knocks you down. Have life's constant challenges ever made you feel like the odds are against you and a victory was impossible? There are times when it feels like the world has turned its back on us. Other people are more likely to write you off when you're down, thinking you'll always be a loser. But here's the truth. Everyone will doubt you. That's your chance to show them they're wrong. A return is the only way to be forgiven, and it has to be such a big deal that it silences everyone who doubts it. I can still clearly remember the times when life put me in a tight spot and I felt beaten, hurt, and almost unimportant. But I knew there were people who secretly wanted me to fail and never reach my full potential. That's when something in me lit on fire. I told everyone that this is not the end of my story. I took a break from the world, thought about it again, and came back months later, changed. You see, life gives us all kinds of problems, and how you decide to deal with them determines everything. I wasn't the same guy when I got back. I was stronger and bigger, and this change happened only because I decided to make a comeback. Now it's your turn. You have the power to go even further than I did, whether it's learning a new skill, making a lot of money, or building an amazing body. People who didn't believe in you before will be amazed when you do it all. Now, let me show you seven important steps that will help you turn your life around and make the most amazing comeback you've ever thought. First, switch to ghost mode. We're going to talk about ghost mode in this section, which is an important step for anyone who wants to make the best comeback of their life. Think about this. While most people are begging for likes and attention on social media, you can go in a different, deeper direction. Many great people in history have gone down this path. They go through a time of obscurity where they work hard without being seen or sidetracked by the world's attention. This is ghost mode, which is what makes a real return possible. Let's talk about ghost mode in a real way now. It's not just about not being seen, it's a trip of deep reflection. As the world's noise fades away, you can hear your own thoughts and face your inner fears. This is where you face your worst feelings, your fears, your pain, and your trauma. An important reason why many people avoid this road is because it is difficult. There is a strong urge to flee into the safety of things like video games or social media. But keep in mind that these are only short-term getaways from real life. When you turn on ghost mode, you have to accept your darkness. The idea is to turn your pain and problems into a strong drive. A Stoic philosopher named Seneca once said, Difficulty strengthens the mind as labor does the body. Your bad feelings are not your enemies. They can drive you to work harder and go beyond your limits. So, if you really want to make a big comeback, it's time to switch to ghost mode. Take a look at yourself, meet your problems head on, and let them help you grow. Now is your chance to come out of the shadows, stronger and more tough than ever, ready to leave your mark on the world. Remember that the best comebacks happen when you are alone and honest with yourself. Step two, pick up a new skill. One of the most important things you can do to make the best comeback of your life is to really focus on learning a new skill. This part isn't just about starting over, it's also about planning to get a tool that will not only help you become financially independent, but also fits with the idea of freedom. Take the idea of having a nameless channel as an example. It has a huge range of ways to make money and it works well with the idea of ghost mode, which is a method I used myself during my journey of transformation. This advice isn't about getting a lot of skills. 
It's about learning one that speaks to you deeply and can change the course of your life. It's not true that being good at a lot of things will make you great. In fact, mastering a single skill that you've picked can lead to huge changes. You can look beyond nameless outlets if you want to. The important thing is to pick a skill that looks like it could be useful and start learning it right away. Remember that the speed with which you begin this journey is directly related to the speed with which you finish it. This method is very different from the usual mistake that many people fall into, which is reading self-help books over and over again without using what they've learned. Putting what you know to use is the only way to really appreciate its worth. Embrace this wisdom and avoid falling into the trap of becoming a mere copy of theoretical knowledge, as the Stoic philosopher Seneca once said. Pick one skill and work on it really hard. Then, act on what you've learned. The key to a successful return is focused effort, not a lot of different kinds of work. It's important to know that our world values specialty and the unique use of skills in order to make this approach work with the way things work now. The advice here isn't just about learning new things, it's also about being flexible and using what you've learned in new ways that fit your personal goals and the needs of the market. With this new skill, your return story will not only be a story of recovery, but it will also be a proof to the age-old truth that focus and dedication lead to success. Step 3. Get even with your enemies. We're going to talk about what I like to call productive vengeance now. You are now on the third step toward making the best comeback of your life. This is an extraordinary step. Imagine this. Everyone who has hurt you, everyone who doubts you, and everyone who tells you you can't do it becomes your source of strength. In the usual sense, you're not out for payback. No, this is about how your own success and accomplishments make you stand out from them. You have to show yourself and everyone else that you're not what they thought you were. Some might fight against this frame of mind in today's world, where sensitivity is often the norm. Do it for yourself, not for other people, they'll tell you. But this is for you. It's about turning the bad things that happen to you into something that moves you forward. This method, which my brother Musa Allah calls productive vengeance, is very useful. But let's make this idea bigger. When you get angry, it doesn't have to be about other people. It can also be about things that happened in your life that changed it. Think about a child who sees their mother having a hard time paying her bills. People could promise that child's revenge would make sure they never have to see that kind of fight again. It's about turning pain and anger into a strong desire to succeed. Write it down. Make a list of the people who didn't believe in you and the things that happened that hurt you. After that, go on a mission, not one of anger, but one of victory. The best thing you can say to people who didn't believe in you is that you succeeded. And keep in mind that every problem you encounter and every setback you experience is just another part of your story of resilience and triumph. We shouldn't let our past hold us back. Instead, let it help us reach our goals. That's it. You've made it back. Make it well known. Step 4. The List of Great we're going to talk about the power of what I call productive vengeance in this section. You should turn any bad feelings or failures you've had into a force that helps you grow and succeed. Think of it as a race, not just against the problems in the world, but also against the person you were before. The most important thing to do is to make what I call the list of great. Picture the person you want to be, the better version of yourself. What kinds of traits does he have? In what ways does he act? Think about these things in depth. As an example, this ideal version of you could be someone who doesn't give in to short-term pleasures or distractions, especially when they have important work to do. He's the type of person who can carry the weight of others' problems, and they don't give in to the allure of quick pleasure. Instead, they choose the more satisfying way of delayed satisfaction. He is in charge of his feelings 
and doesn't let them control him. Now, take these thoughts and turn them into a real list of great things. Write down all of these great traits and deeds. Put this list somewhere you'll see every day. When you veer from this road, this will always be there to tell you to get back on track. You can use it to help yourself improve and stay on track with your journey to becoming a better person. Remember what the Stoic philosopher Epictetus said, say to yourself what you would be and then do what you have to do. This journey is about becoming the great person you imagine by always acting in ways that match the qualities on your list. You'll notice that slowly but surely, you're changing into the person you want to be. This process isn't just about getting somewhere, it's also about how your character changes, how your resolve grows stronger, and how you take control of your own life story. So, go through this journey with a strong heart and watch as you make the best comeback of your life. Step 5. Accept your stoic strength. If you want to make the biggest comeback of your life, you need to unlock the power of stoic resilience. Stoicism, an old philosophy, instructs us on how to concentrate on what we can control while letting go of what we cannot. This way of thinking is very important for getting through the rough seas of a big life change. First, figure out what parts of your life you can change. These include what you do, what you think, and how you respond to things that happen in your life. Then, try to let go of things that are out of your control, like other people's views, things that you can't change, or things that happened in the past. Stoic resilience is more than just getting through hard times. It's about seeing them as necessary parts of life's journey and using them to advance one's character. The purpose of challenges is to put your character and resilience to the test, not to be seen as barriers. For your return trip, it's important to remember what the Stoic philosopher Epictetus said. It's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. Write in a notebook, meditate, and think about things every day as Stoic routines. These practices are very helpful for developing inner peace, mental clarity, and a focused mind, which are all things that anyone who wants to make a huge comeback needs to have. At each step, adding the right punctuation helps organize the text and makes it easier to read and understand. This is in line with the Stoic idea that real power comes from how we react to things inside ourselves, not from what happens outside ourselves. Having a Stoic attitude can help you make a strong and satisfying comeback in today's fast-paced world, where uncertainty and change are the only things that don't change. Don't forget that resilience is often the key to greatness. By following Stoic principles, you'll be ready for the biggest comeback of your life. Make a group of people who can help you. Let's not forget the huge power of a strong network of people who can help us make the best comeback of our lives. Picture yourself on this difficult trip with other people. There are people around you who support you and believe in your goals. These people could be teachers, friends, family, or even people you meet in different groups who share your goals. This group is more than just a support system. They're also your advisors and a place to talk things over. Yes, they give mental support, but they also give useful tips and comments that is very helpful. They give you new ideas, different points of view, and most importantly, they keep you centered. Keep in mind that the people you spend a lot of time with can have a big effect on how you think and act. Now, think about how you can get involved in groups that share your goals. It could be a business network, a local club, or an internet group. Talk about your trip, listen to what others have to say, and make connections that help both of you. It feels like being on a team where everyone wants each other to do well. As an example, think about the life of Thomas Edison. His group of like-minded people helped him through all of his failed attempts to make the light bulb. Not only did they help him with technology, but they also kept his spirits up. This kind of support system was very important to his success in the end. 
As you make your way through your comeback, don't forget to build and care for these connections. They are on this journey with you. And I want to tell you, dear friend, to value these relationships. Not only are they a part of your trip, they are also very important to your success. Remember that each and every thread in life is important, and these connections can help you make a story of an amazing comeback. Develop both mental and physical restraint. As you start your road to the biggest comeback of your life, remember that mental and physical focus are the most important things you can do. When you practice mental discipline, you train your mind to stay focused on your goals. Having an attitude that is not only positive but also growth-oriented is important. You should see difficulties as opportunities to learn and grow, not as problems to be solved. This means making choices every day that are in line with your comeback goals, even when the road is narrow and full of obstacles. Along with mental discipline, physical discipline is the other core. It means giving your body the love and care it needs by exercising regularly, eating well, and getting enough rest. Remember that a strong body is where a strong mind starts. Workouts are more than just a way to stay fit. They're also a way to build resilience, discipline, and endurance. Think of your daily schedule as a fabric with threads of work, exercise, rest, and personal growth all woven together. Stick to this routine without fail because it's in this framework that you'll make success. Sticking to a well thought out plan is the only way to build the energy and habits that are necessary for a successful comeback. It is not because things are hard that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that things are hard, said the Stoic philosopher Seneca. This thought rings true for us on our journey. Everything about discipline, whether it's mental or physical, can be broken down into specific steps that will help you make the biggest comeback of your life. Let the wisdom of Stoicism lead you along this road. It will tell you that a focused mind and body have the power to overcome, rise and win. Why did Newton and Einstein do so well? A person doesn't become great by accident. After all, people who have big goals and work hard are the only ones who really succeed in life. There is a reason for everything we do in life. You're ready to put in extra hours at work to get extra money at the end of the month so you can buy your parents gifts for New Year's. You're ready to work hard and spend time after the girl you love. No matter what, people always try to reach one final goal. Happiness. What does happiness mean? There have been a lot of different answers. A happy formula based on this idea was just released. Albert Einstein, the famous German scientist and genius, said, Genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work. This isn't just a catchy saying. This is a deep fact that these great brains have been following their whole lives. You see, being great isn't just a matter of luck or a gift that some people get. It's the result of never giving up and always working hard. You might expect Einstein to give you a very complicated answer when you ask him what the key to happiness is. He gave a very simple but deep answer. If you want to live a happy life, tie it to a goal, not to people or things. This isn't just advice for finding happiness. It's a plan for a life with meaning and purpose. Let's think about this for a moment. Think about the things you want to achieve that get you out of bed every morning. You'll find true happiness in these things, just like Newton and Einstein did when they found their calling in the mysteries of the world. Their stories aren't just about science discoveries. They're also about what people can become. Thomas Edison was another great innovator, but his path to making the light bulb was full of setbacks. He reportedly said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Edison's story, along with those of Newton and Einstein, shows us that sticking with something, even when it doesn't work, is the key to success. Focus on work and love, Einstein said, to live a happy life. These are the best things to do when life gets rough. For guys between the ages of 30 and 65 who want to live a full life, 
the past often holds wisdom. The lives of Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein, two of the brightest minds in history, provide a timeless guide to happiness, especially when life is hard. This method, which is based on focused on work and love, guides you through life's storms. Think back to 1665, when the Great Plague wiped out London. Like the COVID-19 problem today, this outbreak caused a lot of fear and chaos that had never been seen before. Newton, who was still a young scholar at the time, kept working hard on his work and study no matter what. His general goal, which wasn't tied to specific people or things, became his safe place. Newton thought a lot when he was alone with his thoughts, which led to many important findings, such as the rules of gravity. When asked how he came up with his important finding, Newton's answer was simple but profound. By thinking about it all the time, this shows how powerful it is to keep your mind on a vague, unchanging goal, even when life changes around you. Einstein, too, found comfort in his work after the death of his beloved wife Elsa, which was one of the worst times in his life. He once said, As long as I can work, I will not complain, because work is the only thing that makes life better. This attitude is similar to the Stoic philosophy, which values inner peace and resilience in the face of external chaos. The Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius said, You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. In today's fast-paced and often unpredictable world, this timeless wisdom is still very useful for men trying to figure out how to live a full life. The lesson is clear. Finding a cause that goes beyond the material and the present can give you a lot of security and happiness. Putting all of your energy into something, whether it's a job, a hobby, or a personal interest, can be a powerful way to deal with life's problems and unknowns. Newton and Einstein both showed that the key to a happy life is to keep working toward a goal that is important to you and makes you feel good. You have to find the one thing that gives you drive and meaning and then give it your all, no matter what. Not only does this method offer a safe place to be during life's storms, it also improves the quality of life by giving people a feeling of success and inner peace. In conclusion, the wisdom of the greatest minds in history, such as Newton and Einstein, provides a road plan for overcoming the difficulties and unknowns of life. Our minds, not outside events, have power over us, so we can find strength and resilience by focusing on work and desire. This way of thinking, which comes from Stoic philosophy, can help you find hope and direction in your search for a full life. Remember that when life gets rough, you need to find a reason that goes beyond the material and the present. Choose a goal that makes you feel passionate and gives you a sense of meaning, and you'll find strength and happiness along the way. There is a formula for a happy life that has stood the test of time and still inspires guys of all ages. In order to make the best comeback of your life, you should accept this wisdom and let it lead you. Did you know that the Stoics had a tale to tell? They knew a secret that was so strong that it helped them deal with life's hardest problems with a strong mind and heart. Imagine having the strength to smile through tough times and use every problem as a stepping stone. Not only is this about getting through bad times, but it's also about seeing every moment as a chance to grow and be happy. This isn't just history class. We're also learning how to live a life with meaning, peace, and constant happiness. Stay with me as we talk about how Stoicism is more than just a philosophy. It's a way to live your best life no matter what happens. How often do we say, I'll be happy when... Fill in the blank with something that fits your life. I'll be happy when I get that promotion at work. I'll be happy when I buy that new car. Or even... I'll be happy when the weekend comes around. It's like we're always putting off being happy, waiting for something outside of ourselves to make us feel good. But this is where the Stoics' unique point of view comes in. Happiness is not something that just happens to us, 
Stoicism teaches us this important lesson. It's not a prize to be won or a place to get to. In fact, happiness is something we make for ourselves by changing how we see and connect with the world. To be free, we have to take charge of our ideas, emotions and behaviors and let go of everything else that we can't change. Take a look. How many times have we let the rain make us sad? But here's a tough twist. Remember that you can choose how to react when life seems like a bad day. The weather doesn't have to control your happiness. You can dance in the rain and enjoy the moment with joy and laughing, or you can complain about getting wet and let that control your happiness. My friends, the choice is all yours. Of course, this isn't just about the weather. It's a metaphor for life. People who follow the Stoics tell us that life will have beautiful days, rainy nights, and everything in between. We may not be able to change the weather, but we can choose how to feel about it. Do we let problems bring us down, or do we find a way to dance when things get rough? Of course, I'm not saying this is simple. We have to work on it every day. But the great thing about Stoicism is that it helps us do that. Being aware of our responses, questioning what we think it means to be happy, and slowly shifting our thinking from one of quiet expectation to active creation are all things that it teaches us. Remember this quiet wisdom the next time you find yourself waiting for happiness to knock. Ask yourself, what can I change right now? What can I do right now to make myself happy? Being happy with the little things, being thankful for what you have, or choosing to smile even when you don't feel like it could help. With their beautiful view of life as a series of moments, each one brief and unique, the Stoics saw it. In their minds, everything around us, every emotion, every happiness and every sadness is only temporary. This is not meant to be a negative view, but a positive one that frees you. It's a lesson to enjoy every moment, because that's all we ever have. So enjoy those times when everything seems to be going well and life is going along smoothly. Enjoy the sunshine of those times with a heart full of thanks. For more happiness, these are the times to make memories that you will love and remember. The Stoics would say that it's not enough to just enjoy these times. You should also value them for what they are, valuable, short-lived gifts. What about when things don't go as planned? We have to be honest and say that it will. That's just how people are. This is where the wisdom of Stoicism shows even brighter. There is a steadiness and resilience that we can draw on even when things are hard. Because just like those beautiful moments of joy, hard times are temporary and will pass. This point of view gives you a lot of power. Imagine going through the hard parts of life knowing that they won't last forever. This doesn't make the problems any less real or hard, but it does give us a different frame of mind to approach them. It's about being strong during a storm and believing that the sun will come out again. As the seasons change, so do the things we learn. Each one has its own beauty, difficulties and lessons, but they don't last forever. Everything in life changes over time, and when we understand and accept this, we can live a fuller, more confident life. Remember this stoic concept the next time you feel like life is either going great or going badly. Accept that everything changes. It should teach you to enjoy the good times more, be thankful for them, and face the hard times with confidence, knowing that they are only a part of the journey that is always moving and changing. Even though we can't change this fact, it does teach us that our power is not in the cards we are given, but in how we play them. What really makes us unique are the choices we make when bad things happen in our lives and how we deal with them. Take a moment to think about that. The problems aren't what matter. What matters is how we choose to deal with them. Stoicism tells us to stop complaining about our lives and start making our journeys better. It's a call to action to make the most of what we have, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and live a meaningful life, no matter what. 
It's easy to say this when you're in the middle of a tough situation and problems that seem impossible to solve. Sometimes it's hard to see the end of the tunnel. But this is where the stoic practice of changing the way we see things comes in handy. It means changing the way we see our problems and seeing them as chances to grow and show ourselves what we're made of. You are the artist of your own life. Every problem and unfair turn of events is a block of marble and you are ready to use your knife and hammer to make something beautiful out of it. What you do with the rock is more important than the flaws in it. We are encouraged to assume responsibility for our lives and stop acting like victims by this stoic frame of mind. We may not be able to change everything that happens to us, but we can always choose how to respond. Let the unfairness of life get the best of us, or do we rise above it and use it to make us stronger, smarter and more caring? The good news is that when we start to live this way, following the lessons of Stoicism, we start to feel truly satisfied. Not because life is suddenly fair, but because we're living in line with our ideas and beliefs. We're not dependent on outside events anymore. We're taking an active role in life and making decisions that show who we are and who we want to be. Friends, let's use this hard pill to gain strength. Let's not give up when life is unfair. Let's accept it with resolve. Let's use it as fire to move forward and make a meaningful life for ourselves. Because in the end, what counts is the courage, resilience and ethics we bring to the trip, not how fair it may be. It's not about being careless. It's about realizing that, ironically, not taking any risks at all is the biggest risk of all. In order to grow, be fulfilled and even be happy, we need to be willing to step out of our comfort zones. The Stoics, who had a deep understanding of people and how the world works, tell us that life is inherently unsure. People tell us that we can't be sure of the results of our actions, but here's the catch. They also say that this confusion shouldn't hold us back. Instead, it should free us. Why? You see, once we accept that doubt is a part of life, we can focus on what we can really change. Our choices, our actions, and our openness to the unknown. Think about it. Every big step forward in history, every great love story, and every new invention all began with someone taking a chance. Someone chose to do something that they didn't know would work and didn't know if they would succeed. Yes, not every risk pays off, but Stoicism teaches us that the act of trying is valuable in and of itself. We find our strength and resilience when we take these risks, and sometimes we even surprise ourselves with what we can do. In a serious sense, what does it look like to take a risk? Being brave is more important than not being afraid of anything. Being brave isn't not being afraid. It's choosing to go ahead even though you're scared. Listen to that voice inside you that says, what if, and don't let the but what if I fail stop you. This is true whether you're telling someone how you feel, changing careers to one that fits your interests better, or standing up for a cause you believe in. Stoicism really shines in situations like these because it gives us a way to take risks while balancing courage and wisdom. It means weighing our choices and thinking about what might happen, but in the end it means acting because, according to the Stoics, doing nothing is a risk in and of itself, the risk of staying the same, of never knowing what might have been, and of regretfully looking back on life. In what ways can we use this stoic wisdom in our everyday lives? Start out small. If the stakes don't seem too high, take a chance in a part of your life. Don't worry about what will happen. Just pay attention to how it feels to leave your comfort zone and what you learn from it. As your trust grows, you'll be more likely to take bigger risks over time. Keep in mind that the goal is not to become careless, but to become more present and involved with our own lives. It's about making the most of the time we have, going after what matters to us, 
and living with the energy and purpose that can only come from being ready to jump. The Stoics had a deep understanding of how people think and feel. They knew that our minds are often pulled in two directions, toward the past, where we feel sadness or sorrow, and toward the future, where we worry or look forward to. But here's the thing, life is happening right now with all of its beauty, power and wealth. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but now. Being in the present moment is like finding a hidden yard behind your house. It has always been there, just waiting for you to discover its beauty. When you're in the present moment, you can fully connect with the people around you, enjoy the beauty of your surroundings, and find happiness in the little things. Now, living in the present doesn't mean forgetting about the past or the future. The Stoics didn't say we should forget about the past or not care about what the future holds. Instead, they pushed for a fair view. Learn from the past and plan for the future, but don't focus on the past. The past is a point of reference, not a home, and the future is a blank painting not a prison. If you're going through a forest and your mind is on the path ahead or the path you just walked, you might miss the sound of the leaves moving, the sight of the sun shining through the trees and the smell of the earth after it rains. In that way, we miss the beauty and depth of life as it happens when we're not there. How then do we get better at living in the present? First, pay attention to your feelings. Right now, what do you see? hear, smell, or feel. This is about taking an active role in your life instead of just watching it happen. When you talk to someone, pay close attention to what they say. Enjoy every bite of food you eat. Pay attention to how your body moves and what's going on around you as you walk. As part of living in the present, the Stoics teach us how important it is to be thankful. Being thankful keeps us in the present and reminds us of how valuable and beautiful it is. Being grateful for what we have right now instead of always wanting something else or something next. Being able to live in the present is a skill that we can develop over time. When our thoughts wander to the past or the future, we need to gently bring them back to the present and tell ourselves that life is happening right now with all of its flaws and changes. Stoics knew how complicated the mind is. They were well aware of the trap of overthinking and how it can stop you from moving. Their answer, do something. It sounds almost too easy, but that's what makes it beautiful and useful. So that you don't get stuck in your thoughts of what if and should I, the Stoics say to take a step, any step. It's about doing something instead of just thinking about things. Let's break this down a bit, because it's important. The point isn't to act carelessly or decide quickly without giving it much thought. Stoicism isn't about acting without thinking. It's about stopping the loop of overthinking by doing something useful with purpose and thought. It means recognizing when our thoughts aren't helping us anymore, when they're not giving us clarity or answers, but instead are taking us down a bad path and deciding to focus our energy on something real. Think about it. How many times have you been stuck on a decision and thought about all the possible outcomes, only to end up more confused and stressed than before? Now compare that to a time when you just did something, anything that had to do with the problem. It could have been beginning a small part of a job, telling someone what you were thinking, or just writing down your choices. That must have felt better, right? The power of action is that it clears our minds of the noise and gives us energy, even if it's only a small step forward. Stoicism teaches us that action is the best way to deal with stress and uncertainty because it takes us from a state of quiet living to one of active involvement in our lives. It's a warning that we have control over our lives and can change them in small ways. Also, acting in line with the Stoic principle of concentrating on what we can change is a great idea. We can't always change how things turn out, but we can choose how we act and respond. By taking a step forward, we're showing that we have control over our path, even when we don't know what will happen. How then are we going to use this? 
Start out small. What's one small action I can take right now that moves me in the direction I want to go? If you find yourself overthinking, it could be as easy as writing down your thoughts, setting a small attainable goal for the day, or asking someone for help or advice. Remember that this isn't meant to get rid of careful thought or planning. Those are still important. When you notice that your thoughts are making you stressed out instead of clear, that's when you know it's time to stop thinking and start doing. Stoicism shows us how important it is to live in line with our nature, which means going after what really speaks to us. It's not just about chasing short-lived pleasures or success in the outside world. It's also about getting in touch with what really means to us. It's easy to imagine following your heart as just doing what makes you feel good at the moment, but Stoicism challenges us to look deeper to explore what lights our soul, what fits with our core values, and what gives us a sense of direction. The Stoics say that you shouldn't waste your time on things that don't make you happy. This isn't just about being happy at work or reaching goals in your career. It's about who we are and how we choose to spend our limited time on Earth. Some people might think it's an unrealistic dream to think that if you choose a job that makes you happy, you'll never have to work again. But this idea comes from Stoic philosophy. To find happiness and satisfaction, not in the lack of difficulty, but in the pursuit of something deeply satisfying. It's not always easy to find this road. Sometimes you have to be honest with yourself, think about what you want, and have the guts to make hard choices. It could mean going against what is usual or expected, meeting doubt, or even dealing with people who don't believe you. Here, though, the Stoic idea of bravery comes into play. Stoics think that courage is more than just being brave in dangerous situations. It's also having the inner strength to stick to what you believe in, even when it's hard. What does this mean for us? First, think about what you're really interested in, what activities keep you busy, and what subjects you could read or talk about for hours on end. These are hints, but it's not just about passion in the short-term sense. It's about meaning, or what makes you feel like you're making a difference in the world for the better. This is where real happiness lies. In the stoic sense, following your heart also entails getting ready to deal with problems with resilience. It doesn't mean the path will be easy. It means you're so in tune with your purpose that you're ready to face obstacles because the trip and the goal are worth it. Remember that finding your passion and purpose isn't a choice you make once and then forget about. It's a process that may change as you learn more about yourself and the world around you. It means keeping true to yourself, taking a fresh look and making changes as needed. Our thoughts shape our reality isn't just a nice saying. It's one of the main ideas behind Stoicism and living a worthwhile life in general. The Stoics taught that we can't change the things that happen to us, but we can change how we think about and respond to those things. Because it's a strong warning that our minds shape how we see the world in many ways. Even though the Stoics didn't use the phrase growth mindset, their lessons were based on this idea. They thought that everyone could grow as a person and that qualities like wisdom, courage, justice and temperance could be developed through careful practice. Another important idea in Stoic thought is resilience, which means getting back up after a setback, learning from it and moving on with more knowledge and strength. This is about realizing that life will always give us problems, but how we deal with them is what makes us unique. Focusing on what we can control, mentally planning for possible problems, and practicing thanks are all tools that Stoicism provides to help us develop this resilience. In the Stoic sense, being positive doesn't mean ignoring reality or putting on a fake smile no matter how you feel. It means keeping a hopeful and upbeat view even when things get hard. It means looking for the chance to grow in every situation and focused on the good that could happen. We will still feel sad, angry or frustrated from time to time. 
Stoicism recognizes all of these feelings, but tells us not to let them control us or define us. So how do we get into this frame of mind? Being mindful of our thoughts and how they affect our feelings and behaviors is the first step. It means questioning thinking habits that aren't helpful or positive and changing them with ones that are. Every day, we should work on this habit, which is aligning our thoughts with the kind of life we want to live. Not getting it right is not the goal here. Growth is. It means consciously choosing to think about things that are good for us and will help us grow instead of bringing us down. It's about building a mind that backs up our hopes, dreams and values. A mind that walks with us through life. People have to learn how to deal with complicated interactions, which is a lot like telling the difference between a dream and an oasis in the middle of a desert. Being with certain people should only make you feel better. They should bring out the best in you. Many people can hide how they really feel by putting on masks of friendliness and self-interest. To tell the difference between real friends and people with secret goals in a world full of meetings and breaks, you need both your gut and your eyes. It is very important to stay away from people who feed off of our emotions and have real friends in our lives. Let's look at some trends and signs that aren't as clear, but still show what's really going on behind the empty vows and smiles. There's no doubt that you're here because you want to improve yourself. We're going to talk about these hidden human traits and how they can help you have more honest and satisfying interactions. The first thing is getting fewer comments. When people use other people to get what they want, they are very good at insulting them and putting them down. When people hear these things, they lose trust, self-worth and self-esteem. People sometimes think these comments are funny or just nice small talk, but they're really mean jokes meant to make people sad instead of happy. Some people may make fun of your goals or accomplishments, or they may act like they don't care about or understand your aches and pains. When someone acts in this way, it's like subtle psychological warfare because they don't respect the other person enough, which throws the relationship off. This is a planned move to make you question yourself and have low self-esteem. This way, they can control and manage you more easily. Because they don't like themselves, they look better, which gives them more power in the relationship. In addition, people who are so mean to others often show that they are insecure and don't think they are good enough by putting others down. They lie about how weak they are to make it look like they are stronger than other people. It's clear from their actions that they can't build healthy, useful and mutually helpful relationships with each other. It's important to pay attention to and understand this trend of behavior. When you do this, you can see through their fake charm and get to the root of their unhealthy relationship patterns. It tells you to either deal with the behavior directly, clear up any confusion, or leave the dangerous place. The second thing is broken promises. When you make and break promises, it can feel like the actor's words and actions are not following the script. These people are good at persuasion through words. They can paint clear pictures of support and involvement, but they don't always do what they say after they say it. They make people expect more with the skill of a painting. These drawn dreams don't come true when it's time though, which shows how empty their claims were. When people are in this kind of relationship, they know when to keep their word and help out more. When these people leave, they often leave a hole full of sadness and loss. When you need them, they're not there for you. This breaks your trust and shows you what they really want. They lie to get people to believe them or back them up without giving anything in return. Then, breaking promises is a way to tell the difference between people who see relationships as two-way streets and people who see them as a way to get what they want. When you break a promise to someone, they often learn a hard but important lesson. Not all promises are true. This is why breaking vows is a key trait to look out for in people you want to know and spot when they are trying to take advantage of others. 
Third, only one side gets something out of it. Different parts of a relationship can go through this, whether it's for practical, emotional or financial reasons. The user can take money or resources with the promise of giving them back, but this never happens. You might depend on each other a lot for mental support, praise and attention, but not give much or anything back. When the roles are almost switched, one person may constantly ask for help, time or favors. But when the other person needs help, they are either not there or are too busy to help. In nature, a parasitic partnership is like an unfair advantage. One living thing gets better while the other suffers. The person who uses it gets food, like a bug. Now, they offer emotional, financial or physical help, but they don't do the same or enough to improve the host's long-term health. People who give can run out of mental, financial or time resources because of this lack of return, leaving them empty and unhappy. Most of the time, people who only care about themselves do so because they feel very selfish and cruel. The person looks at relationships like transactions and judges them based on what they can get out of them instead of what they can give. This way of dealing with relationships is basically wrong because it doesn't consider how important it is to respect, help and give and receive from each other. To see this pattern, you need to be aware that the connection will always let you down and that you will never give anything in return. You need to be honest with yourself about whether relationships make you feel important and appreciated or abused and worthless. 4. Don't think about how you feel or what you need. It's like taking care of a yard and ignoring all but one flower while the others grow if you forget about or put less value on your mental scenery. In this case, the other person's wants and needs come before yours and they may even be forgotten. Your mental health is suffering because of what they do and say, and you feel forgotten and unimportant in the relationship. There are several ways that this lack of care can show up. It might be clear if they don't meet your mental needs by being there for you, or understanding when you're weak or need help. It could also be seen in how they don't care about your choices or thoughts and use their main story to shut you up. Maybe they won't notice what you've done well, or worse, they might play down your problems, making the things that bother you seem less important. This isn't just careless carelessness. It's a way for them to stay in charge of the relationship by making it seem like your wants and feelings don't matter. The person who is using you makes you feel bad about your own worth, so it's easier for them to control and affect you. It's a small trick that makes a big difference in how people feel. That is really bad because it hurts the need to be understood, heard and respected, which is a big part of being emotionally healthy. Ignoring these needs over and over again can make a person feel alone and bring down their self-esteem. To get through this, it's important to know how to spot mental abuse, even if you're close with someone. Being aware of this will help you avoid situations that could be bad for your mental health. It will also give you the tools to find links in this kind of group. It's important to respect, care for, and give back. 5. Using feelings against people. Criminals often start by acting like they are interested and care. But in the end, this act turns into a way to make the other person feel nervous, bad about themselves, or guilty. They learn how to gently make you feel good by praising you when it suits them and then blaming or attacking you harshly when they want you to doubt yourself and depend on them. Imagine a farmer taking care of a weak plant by making sure it gets enough water and light. A careful gardener takes good care of plants. An emotional operator, on the other hand, waters the plant too much and then leaves it to die from not getting enough water. Extreme feelings are used to make the target feel unstable. This creates an environment where the target becomes emotionally dependent on the manipulator and always needs support from them to feel good again. An important part of manipulating people is often their emotions. 
They want you to doubt yourself so much that they play down your wins or make your mistakes sound worse. They might make up stories to make you feel bad about doing normal things and put the blame on other people to make you say sorry all the time. It's never fair in a relationship to try to control someone else's thoughts. The manipulator's job is to stay in charge, knowing when to show love and when to pull away. This way, they keep their target mentally dependent on them instead of helping each other or growing. One person's wants are being met at the cost of the other person's mental health in this relationship. To spot emotional manipulation, you need to be very aware of these things. It means noticing patterns in how people interact with each other that change how you feel and then looking at yourself to see how these patterns affect your mental health and sense of self. The sixth thing is that real help wasn't given. In a healthy environment, you can imagine that a tree in a very big forest gets food, shelter and friends. The trees and plants around it make it look like it would be perfect. Think about a tree that is the only one in a dry area and has no other plants to help or protect it. Either way, being with someone who doesn't care about your well-being is pretty much the same. When you are by yourself, no one can help you. Your branch wants to be with someone, but that person never shows up. When goals, projects and challenges are met with lack of interest or empty words of support, this person's actions or lack of actions speak louder than words when it comes to practical help, helpful advice or just someone to talk to when things get tough. You can't say anything that goes against your plans, offer him happiness half-heartedly or even agree with him orally. This is because they only care about themselves and don't offer real help. They only care about the parts of your life that affect them or their goals. They don't care about your problems, mistakes, wins or hobbies. In this way, they can figure out how emotionally invested someone is in a relationship by looking at how much they could gain. One person always gives, whether it's money, time or care, and the other person always takes. To keep your emotions in check and build relationships based on equal respect and giving and taking, you should be aware of these relationship patterns, deal with dishonest people and make friends who are good for you. Because connections with other people are so difficult, this will be easy. Along with insight and self-awareness, being able to spot fake interactions is a key skill. It's important to be able to spot less clear patterns of behavior, like saying hurtful things about other people, breaking promises, or giving someone something they don't deserve. You can find your way around interactions better. With this information, you can make relationships that are truly helpful and satisfying, which is good for your health as a whole. You are about to start an adventure to learn how people work. When two people want the same things, like to grow and be happy, they have a real connection. Number seven, always trying to win. Imagine playing chess where every move both helps you and hurts the other players. You can also expect someone who only wants to use you to treat your relationship like a game. When they succeed, make a choice, or even face a challenge, they use it as a chance to show how much better they are, whether it's by beating your professional or personal records, or by quietly questioning your choices. They act the way they do because they want to stay ahead in the race they've set for themselves. This constant struggle shows up in a lot of different ways. During work, they might try to get ahead of you in meetings or steal your ideas when you're with other people. They might make you feel less important or think they are more important in daily talks if they keep comparing your experiences or accomplishments to theirs. They really want to show how better or more successful they are. They act this way because they are very anxious and have a skewed idea of how valuable they are. They think they are more valuable because they are better than other people. Everything is like a zero-sum game from this point of view. You have to lose if they win. The need to get better and do better is more important than growth for everyone in this frame of mind. 
being with someone who is always competitive can be hard on the emotions. As a result, the atmosphere gets more stressful and competition takes the place of real cooperation or support. People will not praise your successes. Instead, they will see them as a threat to their power. Similarly, people will not feel sorry for their problems. Instead, they will see them as chances to move forward. It's important to see and understand this trend because it helps you set limits and, if possible, change the relationship so that it works better for everyone. Part of this is realizing that the most important parts of a good relationship are not a never-ending race to be the best, but shared love and support. Not there at important times, number eight. This way of acting is like a tree that only gives shade when the sun is out and doesn't show itself when the clouds roll in. When everything is going well, they are there to enjoy the light together and maybe even get something good out of the bond. But they aren't there when things change or when you need help and problems come up. You have to face the storm by yourself. For these people, relationships are just a way to get what they want and they judge how much they care about the other person based on how it helps them. Your support is only on the surface. They only help you when it helps them or gives them something in return. When things are bad, like when someone is having a personal problem, a setback at work or mental trouble, their absence is noticed. The moment they really need your help and support is when your true goals and lack of commitment to the relationship become clear. This kind of action can really hurt the person who is upset. This makes people feel misled and let down, which hurts the trust and dependability that were important to the relationship. If someone asks you to commit to them, you might think again about their part and value in your life. You need to understand this trend to know what kind of relationship it is and what the other person really wants. It means realizing that being there for each other through good times and bad is an important part of any relationship that matters. You can tell the difference between people who really care about your well-being and those who are only in the relationship for themselves when they are not there for you, when you need them the most. 9. Not returning the favor. Think of a seesaw. One side is heavy from work, sacrifices and promises, and the other side is light because it doesn't have to make any similar contributions. This represents a relationship where neither person gives or receives anything in return, even though they are both constantly giving time, energy and emotion to the connection. But the other person generally doesn't add much or anything at all. Different kinds of work can show up in various ways. You might always be the one to start a conversation or make plans and they'll just be cold or neutral. When you need help or understanding, people who are always there for you might not give it to you the same way. Even if you're honest and open about your skills and experiences, they might not be interested or open up to hearing about them. Focusing on oneself in relationships makes people not want to give anything back. The connection is just a comfort for the person who wants to take advantage of you. They won't give or receive anything important with it. They'll just use it as needed. They are involved because it will help them, not because it will help the other person. Such behavior goes against what it means to be in a good relationship, which is to share events and do equal mental work. To know there isn't exchange, you have to watch how the interactions work very carefully. It means checking to see if the work to keep and grow the link is split evenly or if you are the only one responsible for it. It asks for an honest assessment of whether the relationship feels fair or uneven, good for both people or bad for both. Tenth, loss of trust. Find a crack in the base of a building when you betray someone in a relationship. Small problems might not be seen at first, but they can weaken the whole building over time and cause it to fall down. Betrayal comes in many forms, from small ones like lying and tricking to bigger ones that are very bad. Being closed off, dishonest, 
and not talking to each other is a sign of betrayal. You should be careful if you think the other person is always lying or hiding things from you. What gives trust strength? Being honest and betraying trust hurts this trust. Not being emotionally loyal is also a form of betrayal. When you have an emotional connection with someone, they will be there for you when things go wrong. People don't know your secrets or help you with your work. Betraying someone else by cheating on them is another thing that can happen. When it comes to love, betrayal can do a lot of damage. It's hard to fix this. You need to trust your gut and pay attention to warning signs to spot deception. Do not ignore it if they treat you differently or act in a way that is not constant. When dealing with deception, it's important to be honest and open with each other. You should treat the situation with understanding and a real desire to know why you or the other person lied. It's also important to make choices and set clear limits that are good for your mental health once you find it. To keep healthy and effective relationships going, it's important to understand and recognize these trends of behavior. Being self-aware, honest and brave are needed to see the truth about a situation. These are all trends that people often see in relationships, so you're not the only one which them. Dealing with these problems may be hard, but it's important for your long-term health. Strengthening your mental health is always important. Don't forget that you deserve relationships that support you and help you grow when you set clear limits, get professional help, or have to make hard choices. Number 11. Ready to go. Yes, there are times when you have time and not her. It's like a phone line where only one person is open at a time when you talk about a relationship with selective access. You are always ready to listen, help, or offer support if you work this way. They can quickly get to your calendar and mental resources. In fact, that we are both free is about as rare as a comet in the night sky. Things change all the time based on what they want. The choice wasn't made by accident. It's not just that people are busy or have different interests that make them unavailable. The way the person is using the relationship is planned. Limiting their access does two things. It keeps them at a safe remove and gives them more power. People who get time or attention are usually thankful for it because it makes them want more. If you try to get in touch with or date someone in one of these relationships, they will always give you reasons not to wait or even ignore you. Somebody might not answer your calls or texts or might not get what you need. Most of the time, if they take part, it fits with their plans or wants. Most of the time, if you let them run the relationship, you will stop being a valuable partner and start focusing on making things easier for them. If this trend keeps happening, it can make you feel bad. You start to question your own worth and what you bring to the relationship at some point in C. This makes you feel bad about yourself because you know that your work and time are not respected. You feel annoyed and angry when you think about limited availability. You need to know what the pattern is. You should step back and keep an open mind about the connection when you do this. While you're there, think about how much work and flexibility you can put in. Respecting each other and putting in effort are key to a good partnership. 12. Making you feel bad. Think about a case where guilt is like the strings of a doll, pulling the good mind in a direction it might not want to go. These people will use your sense of duty, kindness or justice to get what they want. When you say no, they might ask you in a way that makes it look like you are rude or selfish. If they remind you of favors or events from the past, it could mean that you owe someone money and haven't said it yet. This method of making people feel bad is often sneaky and misleading. They first ask for small favors or breaks, and then they move on to bigger demands. As time goes on, your limits and ability to say no weaken this keeps you stuck in a loop of blaming others and giving in to their wants and needs, which are then forgotten or pushed to the side while they get all the attention. This approach works because it meets a basic need in people. They want to be seen as nice, helpful and loving. 
People who use these virtues to control you do so by making you feel bad. You do things because you have to, not because you want to or because you care about each other. It's important to know when someone is using guilt to control you to keep your mental health and personal space safe. It means being aware of the feelings of the people you talk to and being able to tell the difference between people who really need your help and those who are just trying to take advantage of your kinness. You have to be brave to question why someone wants you to do something and stand up for your right to refuse without feeling bad about it. It is important to spot and deal with this kind of manipulative behavior if you want to build better relationships based on respect, real care, and choice instead of duty and guilt. 13. Lack of personal interest. When people are in a good relationship, their thoughts, feelings, and experiences should flow both ways during a talk. People who care about the same things are always talking to each other. When you're on the street with someone who only wants to take advantage of you, however, the discussion only goes one way. These are based on their experiences and stories. Trying to get the talk to go in a different direction usually ends in a dead end. There are a number of signs that this lack of attention is real. Talking to these kinds of people is a lot like reading a speech that was written as a conversation. They are excited to tell you about the problems and successes in their daily lives in the hopes that you will understand and care. In fact, they become less interested when the subject shifts to you. They can talk about something else, change the subject, or show that they are bored or impatient quickly and virtually with hand movements. The problems and experiences you're having don't seem to matter to you, no matter how important they are. People who use tracking gadgets aren't just bad at talking to people or making friends. This behavior goes further than that. They show what's important to them and what they want by dominating the talk and not listening to the other person. They make an atmosphere where their own wants, views and lives are respected more. When the relationship is all about them and you're just there to watch or give them feedback on their ideas, it's kind of like egocentrism. These kinds of exchanges can be very upsetting because they don't meet people's basic needs for acceptance and respect, which can make them feel small and angry over time. This mismatch can hurt the relationship and make you feel like you're not important in his life, not a good partner. This lack of personal care needs to be seen for what it is. This means being aware of how your relationships affect other people and how they work. These talks with only one side affect you. Find relationships where your stories and experiences are valued and accepted by figuring out whether the relationship is good for both of you or bad for you. Number 14. Conversations with just one person. What people think, feel and experience is like cars going in opposite ways down a street when they talk to each other. When things are going well, this road would look like this. People would be interested in and care about each other. When someone wants to take advantage of you, there's only one way to get along with them. They tell you stories and experiences that make you want to listen. This lack of interest in your life shows up in a number of ways, such as when they try to change the subject to your life, but they usually end up going in a different direction. They want to talk about the little things that happen in their daily lives, like the troubles they have and the good things they do. That talking to these people often feels like talking to yourself instead of someone else. When the talk turns to you, they lose interest. People may expect you to pay attention and care, but they may answer quickly, change the subject, or make it clear that they are anxious or not interested. No matter how important your problems and events are to you, they don't seem to be a big part of your fears. Come on, they're not just bad at talking to people or being social. This behavior goes further than that. This is a clear statement of your objectives and goals. By directing the talk and avoiding your stories, they make it so that your wants, views and life come first. 
they put themselves first in the relationship and see you only as someone to watch or tell their thoughts to. This is a subtle form of egocentrism. When people don't get the respect and understanding they need, it can be very upsetting. This basic need can make people feel small and annoyed over time. This mismatch can hurt the relationship and make you feel like you're not important in his life, not a good partner. This lack of personal care needs to be seen for what it is. A lot of talking, laughing, and even what seem to be private talks can happen. This near feeling never really means anything though. They seem to not really care about the relationship, which could lead to it drifting apart as they enjoy the better parts of it. People are also asked to stretch or give up things when they need to. Number 15. They don't offer much or any support. They might be there for you when you're enjoying and feeling good, but not when you're having a bad time or feeling lost. Also, this kind of surface connection doesn't always involve trust and dependability, which are important parts of real relationships. Plans are often broken without much thought, and vows are almost never kept. Most of the time, you're in the relationship because you're interested and calm. People usually act in this way to keep a list of friends they can use when they need to, without putting in the mental work that real connections take. It's important to keep in touch with someone close enough to be useful, but not too close that you have to commit to them. It's kind of a way to protect your feelings and enjoy being close to someone without taking on real duty or commitment. To understand how a relationship works, you need to be able to tell the difference between how close two people seem on the surface and how close they really are. Check to see if acts of real commitment and shared weakness happen at the same time as the feeling of closeness. It means watching how people talk to each other and checking to see if the trends are the same. It has to do with checking to see if the mental input in the relationship is fair or not. It seems like the two people are close, but they aren't really committed or growing in the relationship. You can build connections based on honesty, shared respect, and real emotional depth if you figure this out. Number 16. Don't show respect. It's not just a mistake or a slip-up in the heat of the moment when someone treats you badly. It's something that keeps coming up in the relationship and looks different each time. It could be mean words or deeds, or they could just not care about your feelings or limits. It can be subtle, like a bunch of little cuts, or it can be clear, like a big cut that makes you feel bad about your own self-worth. Think of a garden where respect is the food that makes relationships grow. It leaves behind a desert where nothing good can grow. This makes it hard to connect or talk because of the disrespect and lack of care that comes with it. When someone doesn't respect you, they use that against you to show that they are in charge or more powerful in a relationship. They may or may not mean to do this. This makes the other person feel less important and gives you the upper hand in a situation where fairness and respect must win. This ongoing lack of respect makes the bond much weaker. When people differ, they don't settle it with kindness and understanding. They turn into emotional battlegrounds where no one cares who dies. Some might even say it's impossible to get back to a normal state of respect and normalcy. When the regular flow of a relationship is thrown off, it's important to understand and spot this pattern of ongoing rudeness. This means looking at people's behavior as a whole, not just one case at a time. Know that respect is shown not only through big acts, but also through small ones every day. When someone treats you badly all the time, it means they don't see you as a partner, but as a way to get something else. This is clear in little ways, like the thank you notes and how arguments are handled. In the end, the fact that they don't care about your feelings or treat you with respect shows that your relationship is truly unhealthy and out of balance. People who care about their self-esteem and want to have relationships based on truth and respect should look for this quality. Have you ever felt like the heavy chains of social standards were holding you down? Or maybe stuck in a never-ending circle of stress over things you can't even change? 
If you nod your head yes, I want to tell you that you're not alone on this trip. Many of us spend a lot of our lives stuck in the subtle but seductive fear of caring too much about things that, in the big picture, might not be as important as we're made to think. Now take a moment to think about this. Is there a way out? A philosophy, maybe, that can help us live our lives with a peace that is both desirable and possible? We are now going right into this kind of philosophy. There are eight ways to be happy that involve not caring. Stoicism is a safe place where we can learn how to let go of things that don't matter, so we can focus on what does. It's not about becoming indifferent or disrespectful to other people. Instead, it's about learning how to selectively connect, focusing our attention and energy on what we can control and letting go of what we can't. It's important to be clear about what we mean when we talk about stoicism before we get into the heart of not caring. This old philosophy doesn't tell us to ignore or emotionally disconnect from the world around us. Instead, it teaches us how to selectively interact, which means figuring out where our worries, efforts and feelings are best put to use. For Stoics, not caring means putting our attention and care on the things we can control, like our thoughts, actions and responses. We choose not to focus our attention on things outside of our control, like other people's opinions or the things that happen to us. This difference is important because it's not about becoming cold or uncaring. Rather, it's about developing a sense of inner peace, caring and resilience by focusing on what we can change. Selective involvement means picking your fights carefully, knowing that not every problem needs our attention or our personal investment. It's about focusing on the important things that are in line with our values and ideals and letting go of the rest with kindness. This stoic concept frees us from the grips of social pressure and the never-ending search for approval from others, leading us to a happy and content life. Remember that, in a stoic sense, the path of not caring is not a path to being alone, but a path to real freedom and inner peace. Finding peace with the changing world around us and security within ourselves are what it's all about. To move on to our first strong way to happiness, let's talk about how to say no. At first look, this idea may seem easy, but it has the power to completely change things. Setting limits and saying no isn't just a way to be assertive in Stoicism. It's also a way to figure out what needs our energy and what doesn't. Being able to say no shows what we value and how well we know what we can and cannot control. Stoic ideas say that we should focus on our inner selves and what we can change. This is exactly what this book is about, putting our mental peace, our goals and our well-being first. By bravely setting limits, we do more than just protect our time and energy. We also choose to live a better life by doing things that are meaningful and add value to our lives. This chosen response to life's demands not only gives us power, but it also leads us to real stoic happiness, where peace and joy rule supreme. To move on to the first way to happiness, let's look at how powerful it is to say no. This easy two-letter word has a huge effect on our lives. Stoic ideas say that setting limits isn't just a matter of personal choice. It's an important part of staying mentally healthy and making sure that our actions are in line with our true values. Embracing the power of no in the stoic way of life means realizing and claiming that we have control over how we spend our time and energy. It's a statement that we won't give in to outside pressures that don't help us reach our higher purpose or improve our health. We keep our space, time and resources safe by saying no and we use them for things and tasks that are important to us. Stoicism stresses that we should know what we can control and what we can't. This practice comes from that. We can't change what other people want or expect from us, but we can change how we respond to them. When we say no to something that goes against our inner values, we make room for our independence, 
our goals, and in the end, our happiness. So, using the word no is not a way to reject someone, it's a way to show that we value and respect ourselves. Not only does it fit with stoic wisdom, but it's also a step toward a life full of happiness and peace. As we move on to the second way to happiness, we welcome the freedom from needing praise. The need for approval from other people is a trap that many of us fall into without even realizing it. This never-ending search can take us off track from our true path and make us less of who we really are as we try to fit other people's standards. Stoicism teaches us to find acceptance within, saying that the approval or criticism of a crowd doesn't decide how valuable we are. Trusting our own judgment and putting our own views above those of others are important parts of building faith in our ability to make our own decisions. As we learn to be more independent, we learn to trust our own inner guidance more than the changing expectations of society. When we want to get out of the trap of outward approval, we must first recognize our own worth. Once we realize this, we can make decisions that are in line with our core beliefs, which can lead to a life of authenticity and quiet joy. In our third way to happiness, we look at how to make your own meaning of success. Society often has a single standard for what it means to be successful, whether it's money, fame or power. Stoicism, on the other hand, tells us to question and reject these outside standards of success and instead create our own version of success that is based on our values and goals. Setting our own goals for success is a freeing process. This means that success could mean seeking information, finding inner peace, or making other people happy. By focusing on what's important to us, we match our lives with the stoic values of wisdom, courage, justice, and moderation, and avoid chasing empty praise from others. Adopting this stoic road gives our journey more meaning and joy than the short-lived pleasure of outward accomplishments. Now, let's talk about our fourth way to happiness, putting what really matters first. This step asks us to learn how to selectively focus, which is an important stoic skill that helps us focus our energy on things that make our lives better and help us grow. From a stoic point of view, we should sort through all the different thoughts and things that come at us every day and focus on what is truly important and worth our time. It means realizing that not every outside opinion, trend or distraction is important enough for us to react to or care about. By getting better at setting priorities, we make sure that our actions are in line with our core values, focused on growth as individuals deep connections with others, and service to our community. This conservative view frees us from the noise of the outside world so we can find peace and happiness in the things that really matter to us. As we go on, the fifth way to happiness is to become unafraid. This is an important part of Stoic philosophy because it helps us get over our fear of being judged and find strength in being alone. Stoicism tells us that other people's ideas don't affect our worth or behavior, and we shouldn't let them. Choosing to live a life where we don't make choices based on fear of being judged, but because they are in line with who we really are. Embracing our authenticity and making decisions that are in line with our core values, even if it means taking a less traveled road, are essential to cultivating confidence. Our resilience and ability to create a life that is true to our core beliefs are discovered in this silence. When we let go of the weight of other people's criticism, we gain a deep sense of freedom and courage, which are qualities that describe a life lived with stoic happiness. On our sixth important road through the areas of stoic happiness, we come to the value of loving yourself. Self-compassion is a fundamental virtue that supports a life of resilience and satisfaction in the Stoic tradition, not just a contemporary idea. It shows us how to be kind to ourselves, see how valuable we are, and accept our flaws with kindness. Stoicism's idea of self-love 
is not egoism or self-indulgence, but rather knowing and valuing our own worth. This kind of kindness gives us the strength to deal with life's problems without losing our cool, because we know that our worth doesn't depend on how well we do in other people's eyes. A strong kind of resilience comes from fully accepting who we are and what we can do. Forging resilience through self-love means recognizing our efforts, accepting our flaws, and praising our progress, no matter how small. This road tells us to be honest with ourselves about our goals and keep our self-esteem separate from the random events of life. Self-acceptance helps us build a strong sense of self-worth that helps us through the ups and downs of life. Self-love is an important part of the stoic path to happiness because it helps us live honestly, make sure our actions are in line with our values and face the world with a calm and sure heart. It teaches us that the deepest source of approval comes from inside, which makes us immune to the changing tides of public opinion and outside forces. Now, our trip takes us to a deep and life-changing part of Stoic philosophy, understanding that death is inevitable. This thought, which is summed up in the strong phrase, memento mori, remember you will die, is not meant to make you scared or sad, but to give you a reason to live your life with more purpose and urgency. The Stoics constantly tell us that our time on Earth is short. This truth shouldn't freeze us with fear, but should give us strength and clarity. By reminding ourselves that we will die, we are forced to think about what really matters, to separate the important from the unimportant, and to focus our efforts on things that give our lives meaning and virtue. The phrase Memorandum Mori tells us to live each day as if it were both the first and the last. This mindset should fill our actions with joy and awareness of the present. Being aware of this makes us want to love more deeply, do more good, and enjoy the beauty of life with more thanks and passion. It makes us more aware of how we can improve ourselves, how we can help the world, and what we want to leave behind as a memory. When we accept that death is inevitable, it gives us a strong drive to live honestly, bravely follow our real calling, and treasure the time we have with our loved ones. This encourages us to live a life that is in line with our best selves, and that we will be happy and at peace with when the time comes. So, memento mori isn't a sick obsession. It's a deep reflection to live fully, to love the moment with all our hearts, and to act in line with the timeless values of wisdom, courage, justice, and moderation. It is a call to live a life that is full of purpose and meaning, even when death comes. As we start the last part of our path to change through Stoicism, we reach way number eight, choosing authenticity over approval. This road tells us to enjoy the freedom of true self-expression, freeing us from the chains of other people's views and social support. Stoicism encourages us to accept our true selves and prioritize authenticity over pleasing others. It doesn't just ask us to ignore what others think in favor of neutrality. Being able to truly express ourselves means having a life that is deeply in line with our values, beliefs, and hobbies. When we choose authenticity, we choose to respect how unique we are. This helps us build a life that is truly satisfying, not one that is shaped by the temporary approval of others. Stoicism values this commitment to authenticity because it frees us from outside forces that try to change us into someone we're not. It is the highest form of freedom. When we put authenticity ahead of praise, we feel deeply at peace and content because we know we're living in line with who we really are. This way of doing things not only makes our own journeys more meaningful, but it also encourages those around us to be themselves, which leads to more sincere expression and mutual respect. As we conclude this exploration into the Stoic philosophy, remember that the journey towards personal growth and enduring motivation doesn't end here. 
The principles and insights you've encountered are meant to serve as a foundation for a lifetime of reflection, resilience, and joy. Stoicism is not just a philosophy to understand intellectually, but a practice to live by daily. The path ahead is one of continual learning and application. The wisdom of Stoicism, with its emphasis on inner strength, acceptance, and the pursuit of virtue, offers a compass to navigate life's challenges and pleasures alike. It's in the consistent practice of these teachings that you'll find profound shifts in your perspective, leading to a richer, more meaningful life experience. Let the principles of Stoicism guide you in all facets of your life, from the trials you face to the quiet moments of contentment. Remember, it's the daily choices the repeated actions in line with Stoic wisdom that will cement these changes, making them a natural part of who you are. Thank you for joining this journey of discovery and transformation. May the fire of inspiration ignited here continue to burn brightly within you, lighting the way to a life of purpose, tranquility and fulfillment. Keep exploring, keep questioning and most importantly, keep living stoically.